Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our session on artificial intelligence for mental health and neuroscience. So, of course, you're all very aware, aware of the uh, explosion in not only the use of artificial intelligence, but the capability with increasing processing power, increasing computing capacity, and, and better algorithms. And um, we're probably, uh, a lot of us will probably live in a generation where artificial intelligence will play uh, a part in our healthcare, and uh, maybe even a big part in our healthcare. So uh, we're here at these early stages, and we'll be able to hopefully see the sorts of parts it could play in, in our futures, as well as the present as well. So we've organized this event for a, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, we are very aware that there are numerous questions that will be enhanced in answering them by some of these new technologies. But also, we're very fortunate at King's College London here that we have an awful lot of experts in this vast array of areas which come under the umbrella of artificial intelligence. Uh, and we're really keen on linking people up as well. So do take advantage of the opportunity for conversation during the break and, and afterwards. And I'm sure that many of our speakers, if not all of them, are very happy for you to get in touch with them if you've got further questions as well. Um, following this day today, we um, will have a couple of workshops. These workshops will be uh, announced and the link to apply to attend will be sent out to all the attendees. Um, these workshops will be on the 28th of October and the 25th of November. And we encourage you to think about signing up for the workshops. The aim of the workshops is to bring a disparate group of uh, enthusiastic researchers together who are from many dis different disciplines around the area of mental health and neuroscience, or maybe just methodologists who want to apply their work into this area. And um, the facilitator will take this group of people through these two days, and at the end of it, the plan is to have uh, clusters of people, loose, loose clusters of people around some central ideas who hopefully will then go off uh, and uh, apply for some funding around those ideas. So this is something new we're trying to try and bring people together across different departments. And so we'll be delighted if you can sign up. There's quite limited places, about 25 to 30 places on that course. So that will be advertised very soon. So who am I, by the way? So I am uh, Mittal Meta. I work in the Department of Neuroimaging. And um, this event is the inaugural event from the Innovation Subgroup, which is part of the Research and Innovation Committee. So we're a committee that represent the researchers at the IOPPN although we have soft borders. Uh, you're very, other people are, are welcome to come to these events, of course. Uh, we represent the researchers. We're here to try and enhance the research experience, enhance the career opportunities and development, and make the most of the expertise that we have around us. Try and help people develop their grants, stop falling into silos, etc., etc. So uh, a member of the innovation subgroup is, uh, is Chris Alberton. So I'm going to hand over to him now, who'll tell you a bit more about our group. Thank you, Mittal. Uh, yeah, just so very briefly, um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, and as any good academic, I'm just going to quick, quickly acknowledge our sponsors and co-sponsors uh, and funders for this event. The first being the RIC, as uh, Mittal just alluded to, but also Aging Research at King's, um, which I'm a project manager for as well kindly put their support towards this event. Um, Aging Research at King's is a cross-faculty consortium with factions in each faculty, uh, and really with the remit just to explore healthy aging initiatives, preventing age-related diseases, uh, impacting policy, as well as healthcare. Uh, and in particular, uh, they've just launched the Longevity AI Consortium, which is applying AI to longevity-related outcomes, healthy aging, and, uh, and preventing age-related diseases. In fact, some of our talks today will touch on uh, aging-related topics. Uh, and then the second thing I just want to outline is that something that we, else we've been working on in the innovation subgroup 
uh, is the IOPPN cohort directory. And now what will become pretty self-evident as we go through the talks today is that AI is data hungry. It's starving for data. And so that having good structured data and access to that data is pretty paramount uh, as an AI researcher and as a data scientist. Uh, so what we've done is we've created this um, directory of cohorts that are uh, either run within the IPPN or the, uh, uh, the IPPN is a key partner within. Um, and we've, we've included things like its size, uh, what target disease it has, if it's healthy controls or a psychiatric indication. Uh, we stratified it according to what data categories it collects. So it will have, some will have genomics, some will have clinical data, uh, cognitive data, imaging, uh, and a variety uh, going forward. Um, our aim is to eventually have this as an online interactive resource, but it's still in its sort of beta stage. Um, so please do get in contact with me, and I'm happy to fire that right your way so you can have a little peruse through and see if any cohorts uh, take your fancy. Uh, and with that, I'm just going to quickly hand over to Maria, who's going to introduce our first speaker. You've got a mic already. Well, thank you, Chris, and th thank you, Mitchell. Um, so welcome again, all of you. And uh, I would also like to welcome people who are watching us at this very moment at the King's College London's YouTube channel. Uh, I hope there are lots of viewers there because I'm missing some empty, I'm seeing some uh, empty seats here. Um, so uh, because of our YouTube viewers, if you have a question after each kind of uh, uh, speaking session, please wait for me to run up where you are and bring your microphone, okay? So don't just wave and start talking, wait, wait for me. Uh, our first speaker today is, uh, uh, is uh, George Cardozo. George is a senior lecturer in, uh, is it Medical Artificial Intelligence at King's? He just moved to King's last year from UCL, so we are really, really lucky to have you here. And he will tell us something about the deep learning revolution and the third artificial intelligence wave. I didn't even know there are three of them. Thank you for coming and uh, let's hear. Okay. Um, Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so my name is George Cardozo. I'm, I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences, and I'm also the CTO of the new uh, London AI Center for Value-Based Healthcare. Um, I work in machine learning and AI, mostly applied to clinical problems, and my view of how AI can revolutionize healthcare um, is a little bit particular due to the fact that I work on a daily basis with clinicians. Um, so when I think about AI healthcare, most people would think about personalized care and improving clinical care, that's normally objective number one because we're scientists. But actually when you go into an hospital environment, there's so many other things where AI can have an impact. Uh, some of them described here, you can think about how do we improve clinical efficacy. You can think about how do we find out what the best drugs are, how do we prioritize examinations, how do we audit what's happening in our hospitals in an intelligent manner, how do we make sure that our hospitals are operationally efficient, so you can imagine things like figuring out non-attendance, uh, how many beds are available, uh, who's going to be moving from Ward A to Ward B tomorrow, so that you can plan things accordingly. So healthcare is much more than just diagnosis. Diagnosis is only a tiny, tiny little drop in the ocean. Um, if we think about machine learning, I mean, machine learning has been around for a while, is, is actually just a subset of, uh, of statistics. Um, and the way that I like to think about it is that um, what, what machine learning does, or what uh, data science does as a whole, is it transforms data into insights. That's basically what we want to do. We want to get, go from data to some predictions, some insights that make sense. And many years ago, when people were doing statistics, classic statistics, as you do in like epidemiological settings, uh, you would think about the human having full control over every single step of the stage, from data ingestion to some form of feature extraction to making a prediction and deciding what the model is, right? So you'd have something like, there's some marker that we found out, uh, there's some relatively simplistic rule, or maybe there's a relationship that was found with some linear model, and depending on this really, really simplistic model, humans would decide what the model is, they would decide what the mapping looks like, what the decision tree will look like, and it will just become in the end a series of thresholds or a series of relationships that are very easy to explain. So humans would have full control over the system, right? This is kind of a step number one. And what started happening was we started realizing that humans are actually terrible at designing models. I mean, for simplistic models, fine. But for anything that has more than three or four variables, humans are really, really bad at it. So what we decided to do is to say, okay, can we remove the need for humans in this last step? 
how, how do we make predictions? If we have features, something that describes the content of our data, how do we actually make predictions from this? And what machine learning did, um, classic machine learning, was to basically say, if you have features, you can drop these algorithms, support vector machines, uh, random forest, like GBM, whatever you want, any recipe you want, and these models will be able to take high dimensional data that might be very complex, and through a series of assumptions and a series of computational processes, it will allow you to regress a value or make a prediction. And sometimes these predictions can actually have confidence intervals and et cetera. But was really the big transformation in machine learning was accepting that humans were not very good at making predictions and deciding what the models look like. What happened a few years later, and this is kind of uh, what happened in roughly 2012 with uh, the paper from Alice Krzyzewski, was um, we went from this situation where we have some sort of uh, piece of information, some image, uh, where some features are being extracted and some algorithm was being run on it and some prediction was being made into a situation where humans realized that features themselves were not a holy grail for humans. Humans were not actually very good at defining features. We think we are. We like to think that we understand biological processes, but actually the features that we force the algorithms to use are reductive. They summarize information too much and sometimes they're not optimal for the thing we want to solve. So we kind of went from this diagram and we said, actually, let's allow the computer to go a little bit further and say, the computer will find the features too. Humans will not decide what the features are. The features are this thing that should be optimized for the problem we want to solve. So rather than having general purpose features, things that we just want to put together and cram into a big box, and then some algorithm will, will solve it, we will design feature, or an algorithm will learn features that are optimal for the task that is being solved. That's kind of where we are at the moment, and you can see where this is going. Uh, okay, so what now? So if you go to a classical machine learning setting, you're basically in this kind of situation where, um, for example, in an imaging domain, and I work very much with images, the same would apply to pretty much any other source of data. Intensities are not good features. We know the images in image intensities do not necessarily mean much. In some settings they can if you are working purely with quantitative imaging, but they're not necessarily good features. Uh, we need to extract features that actually represent the meaning or the object or the, the property we want to measure. So we need to extract those features. And then we took the, take those features and we have a learner of some form, SVM, random force, whatever, and that is going to give us a prediction. And what happened afterwards was basically when deep learning came in, it introduced the concept of representation learning. So really representation learning is to say, can we learn a representation of the data, which is what features are, but can we do it from the data itself rather than having a human prescribing what that representation should be? The second thing that changed was um, the tools. The idea within deep learning, and I'll go there, actually let me just finish the slide, because oh, yeah. So the idea within deep learning is that what we have is we have this really complex function that we're trying to approximate. We're trying to solve for the parameters that, that, of that function. And this is an extremely expensive process. And if we were to use normal CPU compute, we would be there forever and we wouldn't be able to experiment to do things quickly. But with the introduction of GPU compute and at the same time with a software stack that allows you to optimize for these automatically, for example, things like automated differentiation of functions. It sounds like something that is up and coming, but if it wasn't for this, we would be having to compute gradients at every single level by hand and the progress would have stalled. So it's really the tools, the representation learning, and the fact that data is growing exponentially that has transformed what we can do in a healthcare setting and actually in deep learning as a whole. Um, and the interesting thing about the concept of deep learning is that um, pretty much every single question we ask about the data becomes a problem that looks in a very, probably funny way, what I see right here below is we have some input X. We have a series of functions. I'm not telling you which functions they are, it's just a series of functions that we're concatenating with each other. We're saying we're taking function one with some parameters that we do not know, passing the output to function two with some parameters that we do not know, passing those to function three and et cetera. And if we compose many, many, many functions with these unknown parameters, we can transform an input X to an output Y, right? So what you're doing is saying there is a function, some function, or could be extremely high dimensional, that can transform inputs to outputs. We just need to find the parameters and we need to find what the functions are, right? And if you pose the problem like this, actually all problems become the same. Classification is nothing more than mapping an image with n pixels into one of k labels. Regression is nothing more than mapping an image with n pixels into a single continuous scalar value. Uh, one class classification, so if you're trying to find out if something belongs or doesn't belong to a cluster um, as a one class model, it's just a measure of a distance, you're just regressing a distance. 
If you're segmenting, what you want to do is map an image with n pixels to an output that has n pixels times k, where k is the number of classes per pixel. It could be foreground and background. And if you're doing unsupervised learning, most of the times what you're doing is mapping some data into some compact representation Z and then mapping it back to the original input domain. And we'll go through each one of these and you'll see that they're all the same thing. It's just the classes of functions and the dimensionality of the input and the output that changes. The toolboxes, the, the thing in the middle is exactly the same. So there are mostly three building blocks and a lot of creativity around these. Um, you need to figure out what the representation looks like. So the thing, the series of functions, what is the architecture, the, con the functions that you're going to use to perform that mapping. And it is still nowadays what, uh, a big question as to decide how, how do we design optimal architectures to make those predictions more efficient and less data hungry. That is still an open question. We do not know. We know that there is a series of classes of functions that give you reasonable results, but no one knows exactly what is the best architecture. Uh, the loss function, so your objective, the thing you want to optimize for, and the optimizer, the thing that optimizes the parameters given the loss function. Right? Those three components go hand in hand and they solve the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, in terms of the classes of functions, so the thing, when I was talking about taking input and passing it through these functions and output to the other one and the other one and the other one, these functions tend to be really, really simple functions. They could be something as simple as a linear transformation or an activation function or a convolution operation. They tend to be functions that are very simple, easy to optimize, and with easy to compute gradients. And the complexity of the function that you can model comes from concatenating and composing multiple outputs. It doesn't come from each individual operation, it comes from composing a series of multiple and complex operations. You can imagine that if you take an input, you apply some nonlinear transformation which could just be uh, zero if the input is below zero or x if the input is above zero. That is an extremely simple function. That introduces nonlinearities. If you then take that output of that and you apply some simple, simple vector multiplication and then you apply another activation like this, you can create extremely highly nonlinear functions with very few parameters. That's pretty much the premise. You, you compose a series of relatively simplistic functions in a optimal manner as to be able to map inputs to outputs. That describes deep learning, at least in a, in a way that I can do in 30 minutes or 25. Um, right, so. Uh, within the image-wise classification domain, we want to, let's say that what we want to do is to take an image and map it to one of k output classes. What we want to do is to say there is an image which has some size, let's say an input size of 224 times 224 times three channels, uh, and we want to be able to map it to an output that only has one single scalar value and maybe a thousand classes, if you're doing something in like object recognition in image, uh, ImageNet. Uh, each one of these operations are operations that either work spatially, so they compare things uh, within the semantic of the picture, so they tend to be using what are called convolutional operators, so you pass some filters through the image that are learned, and these filters extract activations, and those activations are then reduced and summarized and transformed, and then you can compose these series of operations in a row until the output uh, minimizes the function, or maximizes the function, depending if you're minimizing or maximizing the loss, of what the thing that you're trying to optimize. And the way that I like to look at it is that you basically have two axes. You have, on, on the y-axis, you have the scale, the, the, cardinal, the size of the input, or the size of the current representation. So you can imagine that the scale is quite high at the beginning because the image is quite rich in terms of number of pixels. And what you do is you're going to apply, let's say, a convolutional operator and some uh, uh, a ReLU, which is this, this nonlinear function that I was talking about with x uh, above zero and zero below zero. Uh, and after you do that, you have some representation, which if you were to have optimal parameters for that convolution would give you some features. You do not know what those are. You might be interested in what those are, but you do not know what those are because you haven't designed those. Then what it does is it's going to take that information and it's going to apply what is called a pooling operation, which is a way to average information spatially, and it's going to reduce the resolution of the image. So now you're going to be in a slightly more abstract, slightly lower resolution setting. You're going to apply another convolution, another ReLU, transform the data again, pool gets smaller in size. Convolution, ReLU, pool gets smaller in size. And keep doing this until your output is of size one. It sounds really simple, but it is pretty much this. Obviously the complexity now is how do I find the parameters of these convolutional kernels and of the parameters of the full network. But that's, easy, that's an optimization problem. And luckily enough, uh, there are some relative proofs that we can get good, not necessarily the best global minima, but we can get very good local minima by solving these problems with uh, 
things like stochastic gradient descent. Um, and if you have a network as simple as the one that I described, you can really apply it to a huge amount of problems already you, that, that you can imagine. For example, if you're trying to have some lesions of some skin lesions or anemia, actually you can have it in an MRI, it doesn't really matter. Uh, some volumetric or uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional object, actually four-dimensional, five-dimensional object, it doesn't really matter. You can apply a series of convolutional operations and pooling operations, and there are some decision-making processes as to how to design that architecture to make the problem easier to optimize. But what you want in the end is to find one of K classes. And this one of K classes could be, for example, the type of uh, lesion that the picture was showing. It could be, for example, uh, predicting a genotype from uh, an imaging phenotype, which sounds, it was something that a few years ago people would consider to be impossible, but actually there's features that are genotype predictive from imaging features. So really anything that you can imagine that is an output where at least you as a human would be able to do, where you'd be able to look at the image and say, hmm, yeah, there's this thing here that would let, lead me to believe that this image should be of class A. There's now basically a class of algorithms that should be able to learn something similar. Not necessarily the way you're thinking about the problem, but it, will, it should be able to find some sort of information within the image that can be used and composed in a way that can allow you to make these predictions. If you now take exactly the same problem, um, for example, this was, I think this is now four years old, um, you can take a two-dimensional network and you can actually just apply a two-dimensional network uh, in, with multiple angles, uh, as if you're taking slices through a three-dimensional volume. And by doing this, you can then get multiple predictions per slice and you can then combine the slices to get the three-dimensional prediction. So this allows you to use a pure two-dimensional network to solve a three-dimensional problem. Or you can actually go a little bit further and solve the three-dimensional problem itself. So if we go back to uh, this uh, little diagram that I have, when I said output there, there was absolutely nothing in that output that said that the output had to be a class. The only thing that we said was, yes, it has to be a probability between zero and one to be part of one of these k elements. But that's because we are applying what is called a softmax operation at the end, which is something that takes k outputs and is going to squish them between zero and one and make, some, make sure that they add up to one. But if we don't use that, what we have is the output is just a continuous unbounded value. So rather than saying we're mapping an input image to k outputs, if we say we're going to map an input image to one single output, but this output is just a continuous value between minus infinity and infinity, we suddenly have a regression model. It's exactly the same model. Nothing else has to change. And why would you use such a thing? For example, if you want to predict someone's age from an image, you're just regressing a single scalar value from an image, nothing else. You could, for example, try to predict um, the systolic and diastolic uh, volume from uh, cine MR of the heart. You're predicting the single scalar value from a movie. You could, anything, and again, it's a question of data and the question of the optimality of the network, but the concept is still the same. You take an input of size n and you map it to an output of size, in this case, one, because it's a simple scalar value. If you now go a little bit further and say, what if I want to not just predict a single scalar or classification value from an image, I want to actually be able to segment the image, so contour different objects that I observe in that image. Now the problem becomes going from an input which is of size n, your input size, to an output which is of size n times d, where d is the number of classes that you see. So you say, at each pixel I want to have d values, between zero and one, representing the probability that that pixel belongs to class zero, one, two, or three, for example, if you have three classes. So just, you're predicting basically four values between, zero, uh, between, the, the, between those um, classes. And you have a per pixel prediction of probability, and then you have a loss that says, is this probability correct compared to some ground truth that some human has drawn? And again, you take um, this network here that I was describing, and you see that we're going down in scale, so we're abstracting, abstracting, abstracting and the output initially was uh, at this high abstraction level as a single scalar value. If you now want to move into the, um, into the domain of semantic segmentation where you end up with a per pixel output, your network actually looks like this. So you're, going, you're abstracting scales, you're going to more and more and more abstract concepts, but because you need your output to be of the same size as your input, you now need to go up in scale, so there is this upscaling process. So rather than only having this pooling process of averaging information and summarizing it and making it more abstract, you also have this unpooling or strive convolution or whatever method you want to use to increase the resolution of an image to be able to then bring it back to the original scale and then the output becomes of the same scale as the input and again is the same exact issue. And this relatively simple network um, is 
what is now known as UNET, which was published, I think, 2015, or something like that, and is probably now the most cited paper in medical imaging in the last five years by far. Um, it's ridiculously well cited, and you can think about it, it's, it's actually a very simple idea. It's nothing more than playing with scales and saying, actually, if I want to analyze an image, I want input and output to be of the same scale, but I need to be able to collect information from a large level of abstraction, does I need to be able to travel between scales to be able to have that receptive field where I can look far away, where these features can be descriptive and look far away. Um, and with these kinds of tools, for example, with UNET, you can really solve a lot of problems. Uh, brain tumor segmentation, white matter lesion segmentation, prostate segmentation, cardiac segmentation, you name it, is exactly the same net network. Nothing else changes. Same loss function, same optimizer, same network. Which means you suddenly have a tool that can solve a series of segmentation problems with no human interaction. Actually, I can go a little bit further than that. Last year, I organized this called the Decathlon Challenge, which was, I think, currently still the largest image segmentation challenge uh, that has been run out there. The task was we had 10 completely different tasks. You can see them here, brain tumors on MR. Uh, this was multimodal MRI. We had the heart images. We had some livers. We had some hepatic vessels, some pancreases. It, they were really varied, and they were created on purpose to ex to have a comprehensive view of every single segmentation problem that we could face. And the task was, can you find a single algorithm that with no human interaction could solve the 10 tasks? And basically the outcome was, yes, you can, and it's actually quite simple, and you get state-of-the-art performances if you do everything well. So if your problem is relatively simple, and there are a couple of classes of problems that are still not solved, but for most problems, for example, most segmentation problems, if you have a good implementation of a UNET, for example, you can get really good results in a large, large amount of problems with very little know-how. Uh, another thing that you might want to do is, for example, you might want to look into what is called image synthesis, so the idea of predicting an image from another image. For example, we use this very much in a PET-MR setting, where, for example, if you're, if you're acquiring a PET image of a patient, you have a CT, so you can correct for attenuation, but if you're in a PET-MR setting, you actually don't have a CT, so what we want is to predict what the CT will look like from the MR and then use that synthetic CT as the attenuation map for you to reconstruct the PET. It's a very simplistic process. So you basically want to predict a pseudo CT from an MR, so you want to predict a modality from another modality. And you can argue that physically there shouldn't be anything in the MR that tells you where bone is, about bone density, and you're right. But you as a human know exactly where the skull is, so why couldn't an algorithm do that? And you can see here, if you compare prediction with a ground truth, that models are really good at making these predictions and extrapolating what images should look like even though they've never seen an input. Um, you can also, for example, do image registration uh, with algorithms because you're nothing more than predicting what the transformation model will look like from input images um, and a few other things like this. So I'm going to skip a couple of slides because otherwise I'll be late. Um, so you can really go very far with these kinds of algorithms and you can you have these series of classes of algorithms like segmentation, classification, and regression that uh, can be used, but you can also think about other types of algorithms such as object detection. And they start becoming a little bit more human friendly. For example, there is this little movie of an algorithm trying to figure out where people are uh, and doing it really, really fast. And you can imagine that a similar application in a medical domain would be, for example, to detect uh, lesions in mammography setting where you can actually point at them and say, this is where they are, this is where the object is and there's a certain confidence associated with it. And you have, for example, here, being able to detect um, some hemorrhages in head CT data. So just to, um, in the last two minutes, and I promise that I'll stop very soon, um, if you are now going to the unsupervised setting, so the idea of unsupervised setting uh, or unsupervised learning is that you're trying to learn some pattern in the data without necessarily having an end goal, like a, an output. And the way you can think about it is, for example, you have some input data, you want to be able to, to, in to get some knowledge of that data that is able to give you patterns that exist there without having any other source of information. Um, and the way that we do this is, for example, we take an image, we compress it using a series of convolutions, and then we decompress it again, and we tell the algorithm that it needs to be able to reconstruct the original input, even though it needs to go through this code, which is a representation of the data that is very compact, maybe just a couple of hundred variables. And if you can solve this task, then what you can do is you can sample from the model. So what you see below are actually fully synthetic brains. They do not exist. None of these brains exist. And they're in three-dimensional. Obviously, I cannot show 3D, but they are three-dimensional synthetic brains that do not exist that were learned from 40,000 MRs of patients. So this is synthetic data being 
generated from an algorithm that has learned what brains look like. You can go a little bit further and say, if I know what brains, healthy brains look like, I can detect what unhealthy brains look like because you can find deviations from it. Um, you can apply the same thing to text, where you say, I'm going to take some text and I'm going to <coughs> find some encoding, some representation of this text, which is compact. And if I can do that, then I can, I, I can understand text, and this is the field of natural language processing. But even more interesting than this is when you put these two things side by side, you can do this, which is basically saying, I take an image, I'm going to compress it in this, into this code, I'm going to map it into this other code which represents text, now I'm going to decode it, which means I can get a text representation of the image. And now you can imagine that this is pretty much what we're trying to do in a radiological setting, where you take an image and you want to project it to some natural language domain where humans can understand the concepts in it. And it's something as simple, there's no labels anywhere. It's just two steps of unsupervised learning stitched together, and you can get you something that is reasonable. So just to finalize, last slide, um, we are basically here. So there's many tasks which we have solutions for, the ones that are in full boxes, and some tasks that we are working on, uh, which are dashed lines. Currently, the technology is there. The problem is access to data, ethics, understanding the legal frameworks, understanding the translational pathways, and understanding the route to market, reimbursements, and all of these other things that sound really boring, but they are crucial to get to the point of patient impact. And with this, um, I would just like to say that um, if we go back to this little diagram, I really do believe that the next step is this, where data preparation is not going to be done by a human, uh, is really going to be the job of an algorithm. And we're currently working on um, data harmonization uh, infrastructure that sits within the hospital that can transform the data and harmonize it in a way that algorithms can use. And if you have very good infrastructure that can do that, then you can do the full stack end-to-end -end in, in a purely uh, data-driven manner. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. This was a really interesting uh, talk. I've learned a lot because, you know, many of you know I'm, I'm not an artificial intelligence um, uh, researcher. So, any questions? I'm expecting many. And I need a microphone for you. Ah, here. Who wants to start first? Do I need to start? Oh, excellent. James. Yeah, great talk, George. Thank you. Um, Kind of a philosophical question, but you didn't mention the words kind of theory or, or hypothesis testing in your in your talk at all. So where do you see a space within uh, data science and AI for actually, you know, testing hypotheses? Um, so the way that I like to think about these problems is that they're... It depends what your aims are. If you want to solve a clinical problem, you shouldn't be thinking about hypothesis testing. You know what the problem is and you just want to solve that problem with the highest level of accuracy. So for me, if you're solving a problem, that's it. You, sh you should just apply one of these things, done properly and properly validated, and that's it. If you're actually interested about research and learning more about it, that's where techniques such, such as introspection techniques can come in. <coughs> so you can ask these models to tell you and point at locations where features of relevance were used to make decisions, for example. So you can kind of have mass univariate blobs saying this is where the information comes from. You can do what is called lucid dreaming or deep dreaming, where you can enhance certain features that improve that classification that you just made, which means you can kind of give a visual impression as to what was the thing that made the network think that there was that tumor, for example, was uh, some ISD9 mutated glioblastoma or something like this, right? So it's, it's all about what you want to do. There's absolutely no reason why these models cannot be used for uh, research and why they cannot be used for hypothesis testing. But rather than being prescriptive hypotheses, it will be data-driven hypothesis testing, where algorithms will suggest things, and humans will then follow up and say, oh, I'm going back to my mice model to figure out if this was actually something that is relevant or not. So it's, 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 it's kind of turning science a little bit around, uh, but I think it, it is very exciting to go down that route. One more question? Just one more top, yeah. Thank you, Chris, for running up and down. Uh, this way. Hi, George. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I wanted to know what was your opinion on uh, when applying these machine learning models to um, to medical, to ap actual applications, yeah. um, if we should um, use them to interpret them, to um, develop them, to have more uh, explainability, 
even if that comes with the cost of precision. So I, I have a very particular view on this, uh, which most people don't like. Um, so I, I guess it depends on what you want to do. So the problem, there is a theorem that shows mathematically that if you want explainability, you will lose accuracy. Full stop. There's no way you can get around that. If that's the case, we need to think about the ethics. Is it fair that we are going to, ha to, be, to have a less accurate model that can harm people to satisfy our, will, our need to understand why an algorithm has made a decision? And that is a philosophical question or an ethical question. It's not an algorithmic question. Algorithms can do both. I prefer, if I was asked, would you prefer to have a 90% accurate algorithm that cannot tell you why he has made a decision, but is 90% accurate? Or would you prefer to have a 75% accurate algorithm that can tell you exactly why the decision was made? I would go for the 90 myself, but you might decide otherwise. So I think it's going to be a personal decision. Mm -hmm. One more question. Hi, Jory. I just want to ask uh, uh, what you think about adversarial uh, samples. For example, there is some new networks that have high confidence to predict images that is just a little altered and say a completely different class. What, so, what do you think in this case? Um, so the fact that adversaries exist tell us that our models, our models are brittle. So they have flaws. Uh, adversaries are, however, constructed in a very specific way, specifically to harm the model. In the medical environment, every single DICOM image is, a, is MD5 checksumed and is properly encrypted. So you cannot change pixels, otherwise you would know. So if we have an adversary coming in and changing intensities of pixels without us affecting the MD5 checksum of the file, we have much bigger problems than the AI. Right? The security in hospital is completely broken and they could change whatever they want. Why would someone act on an image to make an algorithm make the wrong prediction if they can just change the patient's record directly? It makes no sense, right? So if we really think about the least amount of effort that they can do to cause harm, if harm is the intention, I don't think that's going to be the vehicle. And so this is not really an answer, but it does give you an idea that I don't think is going to be an issue specifically for this. And when it does become an issue, I think that adversaries will be long gone or at least highly mitigated. Uh, so I, I, I don't particularly think, see that as a big issue in the healthcare domain. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Steve. So what's the biggest challenge left? Do you mean technically or? Yeah, I'm thinking in the context maybe of data collection. Is there, was it the quality control of the imaging so, methods we um, use? I would say that that middleware, that the algorithms that make predictions, they work. I think they are fine. I think the biggest challenge is researchers' need for data to be clean. And I say this as a researcher that loves my data to be clean, but I, 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 I decided a long time ago that I do not want that anymore. So I think the biggest problem is if we work with clean data, models will only work with clean data. If we make models work with dirty data, and yes, that's not trivial, but if we can manage to create models that just work, even though they might not make the most accurate prediction, they will tell you how confident they are of their prediction, that model is deemed safe in the clinical environment. So I think the biggest challenge is actually changing the mindset of the research community to go from a situation where data is extremely curated to a situation where data is real world data so that whatever outputs we create are something that we can deploy and that can be used in the real world. Otherwise, we're never going to be in a safe environment. Okay, thank you very thank much. You very much. Uh, So you will have time to ask George many more questions during our break later on. And we are moving on now to a series of four relatively short talks from uh, KCL uh, and IOPPN people. One of them, first one of them is James Cole. James is an UKRI Innovation Fellow at the Neuroimaging Department. And guess what? He will be talking about how to use artificial intelligence to enhance and help in neuroimaging. Thank you, James. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Chris, for, for inviting me to talk. So I don't know if everybody knows who this, who this chap on the screen is. Um, but for those of you who don't know, he's, he's uh, Sir Ben Kingsley, who's one of the greatest kind of British uh, sort of stars of, of stage and screen. And you know, he'll, he's had a long and, and very successful career. But I don't think he'll look back too fondly on 2015's robot overlords, um, 
co-starring him and, and Gillian Anderson. Presumably that wasn't what he won his Oscar for. But um, for me, part of this idea of, of artificial intelligence includes a lot of hype in the press about the fact that machines are going to rise up and, and take control of us. So I wanted to, to um, take, take a lesson from Ben Kingsley and, and talk about what I, what I think really the principles of AI are uh, behind some of the hype that we see uh, in, the, in, the, in the popular press. Um, and essentially, the, the three principles I'm going to talk about today are, are the fact that machines, AI is basically, for me, machines or, or computer programs, really, that can firstly do the same things that humans can do, but just much, much quicker. Uh, they can adapt in real time to new information, and they can find patterns, implicit patterns, uh, particularly deep learning using feature representation in, in very, very large data sets. And I'm going to talk today about these three different principles and how they can Im be implied to uh, enhance neuroimaging. And this is some of the work that I've been doing with colleagues um, at the Department of Neuroimaging and, and more widely across King's. So the first project is, um, is to enhance neurological triage. And this is a project that's been uh, led by Tom Booth. I've been very fortunate to work with Tom and a number of other people on this who set this up um, and has done a, a sterling job getting ethics to, to get this, this project up and running. So um, it's been a great kind of collaborative effort that's, that's well underway now. Um, so th the background for this is that the demand for radiological services is increasing rapidly as more and more people want to use imaging as part of their clinical decision making. Um, and up to 2018, there were um, 3.4 million MRIs needed to be reported in, in the UK. Now the numbers of uh, consultant uh, radiologists is increasing but it's not enough to cover the demand. So currently there's 10% of radiology posts are, are unfilled um, and the NHS spends well over 100 million a year on overtime and outsourcing for radiological reporting. And obviously this is something that could be mitigated and save a, save a lot of money. So those, those 3.4 million images take approximately 1.2 million hours of uh, radiological time to look at. Um, and the normal way of looking at that a radiologist will, or a neuroradiologist will approach their workload is to do it chronologically. So look in order of scans that, that were acquired and work through them. Now, unfortunately, um, wait, no, in some settings, what this means where there's actually a lot of healthy people, a lot of no abnormalities detected, um, it's not the most optimal way of actually organizing your, your uh, reporting workflow. So if there is an abnormality in, in an image that has a clinical relevance, if that was acquired a, a, a fair while ago and you have a big backlog of images to look at, then potentially this doesn't get looked at uh, early enough. The optimal way of uh, looking at your backlog of images would be to sort them in order of their abnormality risk, where the, the scans that have the highest risk of abnormality are looked at first, rather than just it being order of time. Um, However, in order to do that, we need to have some index of that abnormality risk. And this is where um, our project called MRI Incidental Findings of Deep Learning Identification, which is an NIHR-funded study, uh, also involvement from the Royal College of Radiologists and the N NIHR and King's Health Partners. Um, we call it MIDI for short. Um, and this is really Tom's project, and I've been very lucky to be involved with him on this. But we've had access to a huge retrospective database of, of, of brain scans, MRIs from, from across King's Health Partners with over 80,000 um, patients and over 200,000 images. These, these um, images have all been reported previously and those reports are now being converted into labels by a, a team of expert neuroradiologists. And then um, our plan is to, is to use 3D convolutional neural networks to classify these images based on the presence or absence of abnormalities. The idea being that a new image could be processed through the same network and then be given a percentage likelihood of containing an abnormality. Um, and this way we'll be able to, to take a, a radiologist's backlog of images to look at and rank them in order of the chances of them containing an abnormality so that those that are most likely to contain something clinically relevant will get looked at first and those that are likely to be um, normal uh, can, can be saved for a Friday night um, when with a bottle of wine, if, if that's how you work. So um, we're also going to develop some sort of heat map to make sure that the images are interpretable as well so that we can say to... A, a radiologist, not only does this image have a 90% chance of containing abnormality, but this is the region that is uh, causing that prediction so that you can, uh, so that they can scrutinize that and come up with a, a better clinical report that can, can be acted on more rapidly. Um, so that's, that's project number one. Project number two uh, is, is really the brainchild of, of Rob Leach, and, and I've been lucky enough to work with him and, and Frantisek on this project, um, and, and we call it active acquisition. I'll explain to, to, to what that is. And the background for this is that in a typical scenario, MRI data 
is acquired based on a series of a priori decisions, including uh, the sequences used, what order they're in, the resolution, the spatial location. But this has some consequences which aren't always favorable. Firstly, the person, there might be a lot of superfluous data collected. That means people are in the scanner for an unnecessary long time. The optimal sequences that could actually detect something clinically relevant might not be chosen. Uh, and clinical findings could be potentially missed because of this part of the body or the brain that's being looked at. So what we want to do is use real-time analysis to, um, a, to, and this is Rob's video, which hopefully shows it, to, to take data, to acquire an image, and analyze it in real time, compare it to a normative data set, and then decide on the resolution and the location for the next acquisition, and then, and then acquire a second image, compare that to the normative data again, and so on and so on in a loop until we've got um, until we've done enough sequences until we can make a clinical decision, for example, presence or absence of abnormality, location of a lesion, um, or potentially clinical diagnosis or something like that. So this project is well underway. Um, we've been using Bayesian optimization techniques to kind of uh, find the space of MRI sequences, and we've got a paper that came out and is uh, out in Welcome Open Research at the moment that shows the proof of concept for this idea for detecting parts of the brain that are affected by stroke in, in, in stroke patients. Um, we're currently acquiring at the, at the CNS, so the, at Denmark Hill, we're acquiring a normative database to help um, set, the, set up this space of, of MRI sequences. And in the near future, we're hopefully going to be able to scale up to clinical applications so we can find individually tailored, optimized MRI sequences for individuals to, um, to detect clinically relevant information from MRI. The third, um, the third project I'm going to talk about is, is the one that I've spent the last sort of um, seven or eight years working on, um, which is brain age. Um, and, and this is thanks to many, many collaborations that I've been able to, to put together my work on, on brain aging, so I won't list everyone there. But um, the idea is that the brain changes with age, and those changes are associated with, with cognitive decline and, and risk of neurodegenerative disease. And brain aging is something that obviously occurs in the context of all chronic diseases because it's, it's a, the virtue of the passage of time. Um, but what this means is that we can use neuroimaging, and particularly MRI, to derive measures of brain structure that we can use as an aging biomarker. Um, and how is this done? This is quite a complex slide, but um, basically the idea is you take a very big database of healthy people whose age you know, you run some pre-processing, you, uh, you run a multivariate regression with age as the outcome measure and brain scans, um, pre-processed brain imaging data as the input in order to, um, build, to learn the patterns the high dimensional patterns that represent um, the, the relationship between age and brain volume. You can then validate that model and then take those coefficients and test it in a new brain whose age you don't know and you'll get a prediction of that person's chronological age. You can then look at the difference between the brain predicted age and their real age to get an idea of whether their brain appears older or younger than their real age. This works very nicely in, in healthy people. We're able, this is uh, some data on over 2,000 people from publicly available sources and we're able to get a very high correlation between uh, their real age and their brain predicted age, the mean absolute error of just over four years, and that's in adult, yeah, adults aged 18 to 90. We've used this model to predict age in lots of different contexts. These are just a few of them, but we've shown that having a variety of different neurological diseases can affect your, your apparent brain aging, including suffering a, a moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, having um, HIV, having um, medically refractory epilepsy, and having Down syndrome, am among others. We've also shown that we can predict future health using people's uh, brain aging. So this was a study done um, with the Lothian Birth Cohort in Edinburgh, and this is a, a group of people who were 73 when they had an MRI scan, and we, we looked to see, um, there was about, six, about 700 of them, we looked to see who had died up to seven years after the scan, uh, so about 10% of the sample had died, and we were able to show that having an older appearing brain at the age of 73 was a significant predictor of not only being whether you're, whether you're alive or dead at the age of 80, but also how long it took before you died. And on this um, Kaplan-Meier plot on the right-hand side, the blue line are those people who, who have a ha much higher brain, um, brain age than their real chronological age, and their, and their chances of survival uh, significantly decreased compared to those with, with a younger brain age and um, so that's that's brain age for you there um, so just to, to wrap up um, my work uses artificial intelligence um, hopefully without too much hype to try and enhance my neuroimaging uh, studies um, and what we're trying to show is that AI can work faster than humans to, to optimize how neuroradiologists work 
that AI can adapt to the statistical models in real time to optimize how we actually acquire MRI data, but also that we can use AI to, to find patterns in neuroimaging data that can predict age and other outcomes, and that we can use those predictions to both help us better understand current health, but also predict future health outcomes. So thank you very much. Thank you, James. Yeah. Really interesting talk. And uh, before we take any questions, uh, we need to apologize to our online viewers. Apparently, at this age of artificial intelligence, artificial neural networks, and so on, we still have problems with microphones. So I hope that now everything will be solved and uh, uh, we will continue streaming without any problems. So, questions from the audience? Nobody? Everybody shocked like I am? I think that, half uh, the people have seen this talk before, probably. So. Yeah, but you know, people may be shocked, uh, you know, if, if, if I go into the MRI and you tell me my brain is, you know, much older than I think it is and my lifespan is next seven years. Yeah, well, it's... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, Johnny. So for the, for the active neuroimaging thing, uh, what if it picks up on an incidental finding that has nothing to do with the reason for the scan? So how do you uh, regularize it, I guess? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't actually tested that on the ground as yet, but um, the hope is that it would, it would zoom in on that and, and, and flag that up. If, if that means that that person the hope is with these, with these clinically relevant predictions, we'll be able to get confidence intervals. If, the, if this incidental finding makes that brain enough of an outlier from the model that we're actually comparing it to, then hopefully we would see some very big confidence intervals. Um, and, that would hope, and that would allow you to kind of um, intervene in, in terms of what was going on. You know, in the long run, you could have multiple models competing at the same time. Some would be an abnormality detection model, others would be a kind of clinical decision-making model. And there's no reason why you can't have these models running simultaneously. It's just a kind of power thing, really. Uh, Josh? Hey, um, I was going to ask about invariances. So in the last work that you were doing, the brain aging, um, if you go into a clinical scenario, you have no clue what's going to be acquired about the patient. Um, resolution, if the patient has moved or not, if someone decided to change the TR of T or the acquisition. And all those things interact with age, right? Because if you have exactly the same brain, you acquire exactly the same brain with, let's say, an MP rage acquisition, and you change the TI by 100, you get two images that look pretty much the same, but they're, and they're the same subject, but they will give you different ages because you have no idea about TR, TI, and et cetera. So how do you incorporate physics and patient movement and all of the other decision-making process in these kinds of models? So for the, I mean, for the brain age model, the best results we've got are after we've used quite a lot of pre-processing. So we tend to use uh, voxel based morphometry as the kind of pipeline to get brains normalized and, and spatially smooth and things like that. And we tend to see that actually that washes out quite a lot of those effects and you're left with a representation of volume uh, in, in sort of inverted commas. So hopefully the specifics of the acquisition don't necessarily have a huge um, impact. The other way that we've kind of dealt with it is by, is by having slightly dirty training sets. So not having models, the healthy training set isn't necessarily one acquisition, so that hopefully it's kind of able to cope with these slight changes. But for example, if you take literally a healthy brain and you change the TRT ratio enough, it, you will make it look like it's unhealthy. Even a human will tell you so. Like like the, like a, a, a radiologist will not be able to appropriately age a brain just because you change the TRT setup that the contrast is going to be so different that the brain will look old. So you, you can't just, unless physics are given to the model, I don't think you can somehow get the patient age. Well, we've managed to validate it in a number of different settings. Um, and maybe we haven't been faced with a cheeky physicist who wants to uh, cause problems for us yet. But no, you're, you're quite right. That is something to, to think about. And last question, Steve again. I was amazed by the graph of brain age versus chronological age, where it's pretty good all the way along. I would have thought that you'd be more sensitive when you're very young or you're very old, and things are more sort of flat in your 30s and 40s. But Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so I mean, we don't have very young data. The youngest age on that's on, that I've used is 18, up to 90. Um, 
generally the variance of the prediction does get a bit worse as it, the older end of the lifespan, possibly because of greater variance in people's brains, possibly because of a slightly sparser training data set. But um, yeah, generally the, the, the trend seems to be quite linear across the lifespan. There is some idea that maybe people who are sort of 85 plus might be a kind of special case that might be not a linear trajectory, but we've kind of limited it to about 90 as the, as the upper limit. Thank you. Thank you. And okay, one last, last, really. Hi, James. Um, what do you think about the uh, uh, adoption of uh, deep learning to predict brain age? Uh, because there's some recent uh, studies mentioned, for example, that uh, neural, neural imaging data, some kind of neural imaging data, doesn't have non linearities enough to uh, deep learning have a better accuracy compared with shallow uh, methods. What is your opinion about this? We have, we have used deep learning to predict brain age, actually. And we, we found that when you use pre-processed data, the prediction accuracies were very, very similar to sort of tradition, more traditional machine learning approaches. But we did try actually predicting age from entirely raw, unprocessed data that hadn't had any normalization or anything. Um, and the, the standard models don't work very well with that at all. But the deep learning models were able to, using a 3D convolutional network, we were able to predict age with the same accuracy. So with deep learning, you potentially, as, as George um, outlined, you can get to the features without having to kind of hand engineer them. So that seems to be a, a good way forward, yeah. Thank you, James, once more for this nice talk. And we are moving on to Daniel Lightley. He's coming from the Department of Psychological Medicine. And Daniel will tell us something about how to use machine learning to uh, possibly identify post-traumatic stress disorder in military personnel. Thank you very much. Excellent. So thank you very much for the introduction. As I said, my name's Dan Likely. I'm a postdoc working at the King's Centre for Military Health Research, where my job ultimately is to conduct research where we're trying to understand the um, health and well-being of armed forces personnel. And by that, we mean both serving personnel, veterans, and their families. So in this work, I'm just going to talk about briefly how we're using some of our data to be able to identify probable PTSD. But PTSD is just the context, um, and I'll explain why we focus on PTSD initially. Um, but what we're interested in ultimately, our ultimate goal is to be able to develop platforms and pipelines that will be able to help the armed forces. So when they're serving, when they've transitioned into civilian life as a veteran, but also potentially it could benefit other um, high intensity occupations. So. Why am I we initially focusing on PTSD? Well, anyone who's aware of the military is aware that PTSD is quite a nuclear topic when it comes to veterans' mental health. So we started off looking at um, PTSD several years ago on um, how we can use machine learning to be able to support the, the prediction of PTSD. And over recent years, it's got gained more traction, especially if any of you who watch uh, The Bodyguard on BBC. That resulted in a lot of positive actual uh, media coverage and a lot more veterans were seeking help um, with regards to PTSD but obviously the media is uh, driving us to look at this topic but how does PTSD compare with other parts of the armed forces so as you can see common mental health disorders since 2004 up until 2016 have increased surprisingly alcohol misuse has actually decreased over the period but PTSD the prevalence rates of PTSD are increasing that is what we're seeing from our data at the moment and this data comes from the King Center for Military Health Research, Health and Wellbeing Cohort, which is a cohort of armed forces personnel that was started in 2003 uh, and tracks them every five years, irrespective of their time point, whether they are currently in service or whether they transitioned out of service. And it's this point of PTSD that we're very much interested in at the moment, and it's important to acknowledge that PTSD is typically not often diagnosed in isolation. It's highly comorbid and is often diagnosed with other uh, mental health conditions, and that is why and we're adding that caveat in there to some of the models that we've been working on because we suspect that we're also modeling other conditions. And just a note on terminology, when we say probable PTSD, as this is a cohort questionnaire, this is completed through a questionnaire so we don't actually have a clinical diagnosis. While the measures have been approved by the World Health Organization and validated, you know, the caveat is when I talk about any of our actual results, it's always going to be probable. So. As I've said, what is our ultimate goal? So what we want to do is ultimately generate a data-driven, holistic approach that will enable us to um, support the armed forces community in their health and well-being, 
but also try and identify um, ill health before manifestation. So can we identify before relapse or before onset? Why is this important? Well, the last thing we want to do is put a firearm in someone's hands and send them out on the front line. So if we can identify those issues beforehand, we're potentially you know, stopping a lot of issues, but also being able to provide early support to the armed forces. Uh, and what we're also really interested in is how can we increase additional uh, data modalities? So at the moment, we are limited in some of the data that we have. And while we're expanding those data sources, we definitely want to introduce additional data streams so that what we can do is track and be able to provide in real time uh, markers of concern and then um, clinicians and the Ministry of Defence, et cetera, can then uh, intervene and be able to provide that support. But when we talk to colleagues within across defence, they have a lot of concerns around machine learning. And again, it goes back into what was discussed earlier around the media perceptions. The media has spoken about machine learning as this, you know, this, um, well, often when you see it described, they usually have some very dark man in a hood um, or very dark imagery that they use when they're using uh, news articles to describe me machine learning. And we've got, what we've had from uh, colleagues is this idea of perception. So unfortunately, if anyone recalls the deep mind and Greenwich Hospital issue, um, that caused a lot of negativity, and especially within government circles. And ultimately, it was more a case of them not actually understanding what actually was occurring than actually anything nefarious actually taking place. Understanding this keen part, as has been touched on earlier, how can we understand what's happening inside the algorithms? And this is really important from an assurance point of view when we're trying to deliver care, accountability, you know, who is to blame if the algorithm is wrong, is it the developers, is it the end user? And what's great is we're, we're seeing Parliament tackle this question at the moment, and we've seen some issues come out of uh, the states in terms of the self-driving, uh, the automatic cars and Tesla, around issues around um, who's responsible for those types of um, issues when they go wrong. And then we've got this human factor, this con concern around job loss. And that's um, more so, and when I was having a meeting recently with colleagues from the Ministry of Defence, they touched upon if anyone was around when Royal Mail had significant strikes in the early 2000s because of modernisation. There's this concern around what is this AI revolution? Is it going to result in job losses? How are we going to ha handle any potential strikes, etc.? So it's those sorts of concerns that we're we're facing and I think there's a lot of work going on at the moment to tackle some of these issues and some of them are more just you know explaining it better they're actual non-issues but it's just how do we articulate in a better way um, and I briefly want to talk about what other work we're doing within military health to be able to utilize technology so here is one of well, the three examples so one is we have something called index which is our platform that tackles alcohol misuse in armed forces personnel but it tackles it by using data provided by the user behavioral change theory and machine learning so it personalizes content on the fly in real time to support the user as they are consuming alcohol over a period of time the idea is to reduce the ultimately the goal of index is to reduce the number of units consumed over the lifetime and initial results from that trial suggest that actually Personalization, which actually can't be done you know, manually by human, but using machine learning models has been effective and we have noticed decreases and we're now rolling that out to do a randomized control trial in 600 patients uh, early next year. We've also got another uh, platform which is called HeadSmart, which links into what I touched upon earlier about transition in armed forces personnel, but it's highly relevant to other occupations as well. When people are transitioning from high intensity occupations to more civilian uh, roles or low intensity roles, we know there is a significant impact on one's health, both physical and mental. So in the armed forces context, when someone transitions because there's no one requiring them to do their mandatory physical health, obesity skyrockets. And as obesity increases, we know common mental health disorders, depression, anxiety also increase as well. So how can we intervene to encourage them to maintain that act those activity levels to support their health? And we use machine learning in this platform to be able to generate user insights. So the idea is, can we analyze the data to identify some markers in that data to be able to push active clinical involvement to encourage people to be able to um, remain physically active? And then the final one is um, a recent one that we've been doing is this idea of taking a step back instead of inter intervening with the actual individual themselves. Can we not interrogate their medical records? So right now in the UK, there are an estimated two and a half million 
veterans in the UK. Why estimated? Because we actually don't know how many veterans there are. We don't keep those statistics, nor do we record them in terms of in electronic healthcare records. So we've had to then use machine learning to be able to go through uh, the South London Maudsley Hospital Trust, NHS Trust databases to be able to identify who is and is not a veteran to be able to generate some mental health statistics. So we can actually get a profile of help-seeking veterans compared to a civilian cohort. So it's a case of demonstrating here that you know, machine learning can not necessarily, doesn't necessarily need to be used directly on the patient, but we can use it to generate more top-level insights, both you know, locally within a trust, regionally and nationally. And it brings me on to this approach, which I'm going to have to speed up to talk about, which is we use, decided to approach a classical approach to machine learning initially. So we are of the opinion that we should start at basic level first and work our way up. So there's no point jumping into the complex models if a more simplistic model is able to work. So in this one, we used uh, 13,500 um, personnel's uh, data, and they'd all completed the PCLC to be able to train multiple classical machine learning algorithms. Now, we did it on over 20 algorithms, but in this one, I'm only just going to present four. And we used 22 variables from this large, this data set has about 3,000 variables in it. And you know, these are variables around, um, do you consume alcohol? What's your age, gender? Which um, conflict zones have you deployed? The main outcome of this work was to see, can we predict probable PTSD if someone is going to experience certain factors? Like, if they're going to be deployed, are they going to experience combat. If they're going to experience combat, can we detect that in the models? So the idea is, could we early screen and detect PTSD, probable PTSD before they actually face that situation? And ultimately what we found is that overall accuracy was good, sensitivity, specificity was you know, average, um, but we were always saw these as an introductory part and we never actually determined that these would you know, we think in more complex models that we've done recently that we've actually improved upon these results. But what we're interested in is baseline results. But more so what we're interested in, work from colleagues, going on and colleagues, is which features actually contribute to a prediction. So that was what we were more interested in. And we were, the vast majority of these were supported by the literature, but we were surprised by one or two of them. And this was what was great, because it gave us a different perception and how we could look at how different models made different sort of predictions, so which features contribute to an outcome, which we were very uh, interested in. And I'm going to briefly just touch upon this, because I think it's quite important. So I get asked a lot, how do we actually get involved in machine learning, or we want to run it on our data? And actually, you don't need a lot of money. You know, This is not a resource-intensive process if you approach it right. So I replicated the study findings that we had on publicly available data. So the UK Data Archive has thousands of data sets that are publicly available that you can go access and download. Microsoft has something called Machine Learning uh, machine learning Studio, where you can go and train models for free. They have certain resource limitations that you can go and train your models for free. So you're able already to start to interface, to utilize machine learning. What's great about Microsoft is their platform. It's drag and drop. Now, there are some issues around that if you don't understand some of the theory, but ultimately you're, you are able to train a model within a couple of minutes by using publicly available data for free to give you an introduction in how to do it. So I really want to stress that because a, a lot of the time people are like, it's really difficult to get into, but actually setting up an account, importing the data, and having a trained model you can have done within five to ten minutes. Understanding what's actually happening will take much longer. Um, and what's next to us? So, we're interested in now, well, what we have been doing with our PTSD detection is spanning it out. We're now looking at mental health in the broadest of senses, and we're feeding in not just self-report, but we've also linked electronic healthcare record data. We have Department for Work and Pensions data. We have Ministry of Justice data. So we're interested in how can we create a more holistic approach of, because mental health is impacted not just in what they say in terms of their self-report questionnaire, but also you know, their income, their... Um, Ministry of Justice data, and also there's a, when we rely on self-report data, there's always a recall bias, and uh, people not necessarily, or giving us the socially acceptable and desirable answers. But then also things more about wearable tech, which we're approaching cautiously because we're concerned that in a military setting, um, I don't know if anyone saw that Strava did map a lot of secret US bases and publish that data on their website, and no one realized, and there was a big hoo-ha around that. Um, but wearable is something that we're definitely looking at. And then also phone data itself. So depression is an interesting one because 
with depression, we're able to use the phone battery potentially to be able to see if someone is not charging their phone. So they had a two month period of continuously charging their phone and then they for all of a sudden have stopped charging their phone and you've got phone battery level data. You know, could that potentially indicate some form of depression or some form of depressive relapse? So that's what the, some of the pathways that we're exploring. And I think I've probably have gone over time. Um, excellent, I can continue on. And then the next step is to, right now, a lot of our models have been done offline. And there are a lot of services now available. And we call it MLAS, machine learning as a service, where you have a web API endpoint. You send some testing data. It gives you a prediction back. And actually, we found from a, a resource point of view, when we actually work out the sums, that is cheaper for us to do using cloud-based tech than it is to continuously buy in the latest hardware at a local level. So we're now exploring more um, cloud-based solutions, but we're having to approach it from a, um, a data assurance point of view of where that data is housed and located um, for obvious security reasons. And then it goes back into the outcome is no longer, we're no longer interested in like, does someone have probable PTSD, depression, anxiety, et cetera. We're more interested in what are the, their risk factors for them having that diagnosis. So can we identify what lifestyle traits they're exhibiting at that point that we can then directly intervene on so it's not just a case of, hey, you have depression. It's actually, well, your depression is being caused because of your sedentary behavior, your diet, or your lifestyle, or your financial situation, and then be able to offer a targeted approach on those risk factors to be able to support them. So again, it goes back into this more holistic approach. And that is work that we're currently ongoing at the moment, and hopefully we'll have something in the next year or two. Um, and that's everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Interesting talk uh, and very, very relevant um, for our military people. Um, and wider questions. Oh, first row. Um, just a second to get the microphone. Thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you have suicidality data in your database and if you've been looking at a prediction of suicidality, which of course would be a critical goal in this group. Contentious issue, suicide. Um, I think, again, this is a media point of view. Largely, veterans are no different in terms of suicide rates to the general population and data that we've seen. But we don't actively record at the moment suicidality in our data sets. Uh, it's something that we're wanting to address, but it's a contentious issue. But the data that we do have is that suicide is not statistically different from what we see in the general population. And depression? Depression, Pills again, well. what, is, what are the main issues in the armed forces? Anxiety, depression, common mental health disorders. Those are the top three con uh, conditions that armed forces personnel experience, and those are all greater than the general population, and that's why we're wanting to target on those. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Really interesting. And I wonder whether you thought about potentially sort of generalizing your approach to other populations, for instance, uh, pensioners uh, or people transitioning uh, from you know sort of you know the um, working life to pension, which is a sort of a typical uh, independent factor for depression. Yeah, absolutely. We have spent a lot of time considering how can we generalize the work that we've been doing to other high intensity occupation, whether that be first responders, uh, people transitioning there to uh, to be pensioners, etc. We're not that, we don't, we don't feel we're there yet in terms of our current population to be able to replicate the findings in others, but it's something that we are considering, especially at the moment. We've had discussions with the, uh, the police to be able to focus on them. And the last question. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I expect that, especially within the military, there'll be stigma with personal, um, with mental health diagnoses. So with something like this, are you hoping almost to give a pre-diagnosis to be able to tell people once identified that you don't necessarily have this condition yet? We've got some risk factors we've identified which makes you more likely for you to have a, um, like a bad experience or something bad happen um, and also have you thought about using chat boxes or things like that with the phones where people might be more willing to divulge information i'll answer your last point first so we've got to consider who joins the armed forces the vast majority um, have low literacy and educational attainment levels um, chat box is something we've considered but when we've had focus groups and we've 
even basic focus groups giving them certain por portions of text, they found it really difficult to read. One thing that we have found in the armed forces, especially the lower ranks, is infographics, data-driven visualizations of their health is actually what they more resonate with. And if you compare that to their peers or the civilian population, on your first point around help seeking, there are issues around help seeking um, within the armed forces. And the help seeking concern, ultimately, if you go to your a regimental medical officer and you say I have a concern you may be reporting in restricted duties you may have firearm rights removed so there are concerns there we are trying to position the work that we're doing as an aid to support the whole process we're keen to avoid potentially giving someone a label when they've got an early diagnosis because they that they that men may they may then attach that going forward so if we say you've potentially got depression but they then go don't go seek help how do they handle that potential diagnosis going forward? So we're still trying to figure out, and this is where we're doing participant engagement, how do we distill our findings to you? So a lot, all the work that we do is co-designed. So within the King Center for Military Health Research, we have uh, two um, armed forces personnel, uniformed armed pers forces personnel embedded within the team. So we're able to interact with them and get their experiences. But on that point, it's a case of, there's, We've still got a long way to go in terms of how do we translate our findings into language they understand that then ultimately ensures that they then go seek help. Thank you very much, Dan, again. And we are moving uh, forward in the interest of time. So if you have more questions, please ask Daniel uh, during the, the break. Our next speaker is Chris Kalfatis, and uh, he's a consultant in old age psychiatry. And he will tell us something about AI uh, based cognitive biomarkers in dementia. Can you hear me? No? Not really. No, no difference, right? Any difference? Yeah? Okay. Uh, where am I? Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm an old age psychiatrist, uh, and apologies, my, my talk um, was aimed at sort of, you know, sort of an audience that has a basic uh, sort of knowledge of dementia, so I'm just going to start um, a little bit by saying that uh, dementia sort of, uh, is an umbrella term for uh, neurodegenerative processes, which you may have heard of, um, such as Alzheimer's. To put it into context, um, it costs the um, health services about a trillion dollars a year. So if it were um, uh, a country, it would be attending the G20 every year. I think it would probably be about the ninth or tenth biggest economy in the world. So that's, that's how sort of uh, huge the impact of dementia is. And one of the reasons why it's so significant is because um, it's incurable and there is a consensus that um, one of the problems with um, obviously sort of um, curing the disease is identifying um, cognitive impairment, which is sort of a classic feature of, um, of dementia early on. So uh, my talk will focus on um, the integrated cognitive assessment, which is a computerized cognitive test uh, in relation to the limitations of existing cognitive assessments, um, cognitive biomarkers as we call it, um, and how the test actually tackles um, these limitations in clinical uh, and from a clinical and research pr perspective towards um, uh, early diagnosis. So I'll, I'll present this summary of the characteristics uh, of the test. Um, and I will take you from sort of how we developed the test to uh, test our hypothesis from proof, proof of concept to reliability uh, to the practice effect, which is really important in, in cognitive tests, validity, and of course uh, conclude with the next steps in, in our pipeline. So this test sort of has become 
um, a sort of a small startup as a result. So, um, you know, so in the Western world, we diagnose a fraction um, of dementia cases, and that's uh, just in the high in uh, income taxes. We're looking at about probably about 40% at best. So we wanted to develop a test that can close the gap both in clinical practice and in research. Um, so such a test must have certain attributes. Uh, so it absolutely has to be well sensitive and reliable, um, and clearly accurate, uh, accurate, but also quite accessible to, uh, for large population use. So it ought to be independent of language and it ought to be independent of educational limitations. Uh, it should be quite quick and easy to use, and ideally it should be self-administered. Um, these are two attributes that save valuable clinical time uh, and also eliminate rater bias, which is significant uh, in most tests. Uh, and ideally the test scores should be able to integrate um, uh, sort of uh, quite well with electronic patient records to avoid interpretation and uh, transcription errors. We want to be able to monitor cognitive decline, um, sort of, I remind you that sort of dementia is a neurodegenerative process, so sort of cognition um, declines uh, quite gradually. We want, and we want to monitor this in high resolution, so we aimed to design a test that cannot be learned. So in order for one to repeat the test, um, they, they shouldn't be able to learn it, otherwise uh, obviously the results wouldn't be entirely uh, uh, invalid. Uh, and finally, uh, the test should be able to make use of the wealth of data that the users provide, learn from itself, and improve its accuracy. That's, uh, thus, uh, AI. So with the set of characteristics in mind, we designed the test, which is a very quickly, I'm going to say, it's computer-based, it's a rapid visual categorization task uh, with backward masking that takes approximately five minutes to complete versus sort of average tests that take about anywhere between for 20 minutes to a couple of hours uh, at the time. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how it works. It's basically um, 100 natural images, 50 of animals and 50 of non-animals uh, are presented sequentially. Each image is shown for 100 milliseconds. It's followed by a, a 20 millisecond uh, interstimulus interval, uh, followed by uh, uh, a noisy mask for 250 milliseconds. The subject is then asked to select whether they see an animal or not by tapping left or right on an iPad. Now, the reason why um, we chose uh, animals is because of the brain's innately uh, strong response to, to animal stimuli. And also here lies sort of part of the novelty of this assessment because we use image statistics uh, to characterize each image individually. And so the images vary in terms of difficulty. And this categorization is accounted for, uh, and it's key uh, in our analysis. All images are grayscale because, you know, if you can see colors, it's, uh, you're much more likely to, to, uh, to pick an animal uh, in the picture. So, and you can see some of the uh, sample images at the bottom of the, of the slide. So here's really sort of how the test looks uh, in practice. So the qualitative feedback from, from our users uh, has been really, uh, sort of really, really useful, ma mainly because uh, the take home for us was that the, the, the test is uh, intrinsically gamified. So users want to actually do the test again because they want to actually improve their scores. And I'm gonna talk to you about, about this uh, sort of a few slides down. Now, the data science component is central uh, in how the results are actually sort of uh, analyzed and generated. So the test measures categorization accuracy, processing speed, uh, accuracy and speed over time, and the raw data from these measurements are combined with patient data. At the moment, uh, we're uh, using primarily demographic data in order to provide a composite score. We use uh, different statistical analysis models, as you'd expect, to classify by comparing with previously learned clusters. Uh, so we call the, the test, sort of, the, we, we call the AI engine adaptive or modular to, uh, when, I, when I speak to other clinicians. And what that means is that uh, new clinical and demographic data can be added onto uh, the test to generate um, actually um, 
uh, sort of um, specific uh, new sp uh, population sp specific models. So for instance, relating um, the test with the new sort of ex existing biomarkers uh, in order to actually uh, improve its accuracy. So uh, the use uh, of AI in multi-class classification problems is actually quite crucial and I want to take a moment to describe it when it comes to cognitive assessments. So uh, in conventional um, cognitive tests, we solve, we typically solve a one-dimensional classification problem. So take, uh, if anyone knows, sort of a classic uh, cognitive test is a pen and paper test called uh, minimal to site examination. It's, uh, it's a 30-point test. And the typical cutoff is 23 out of 30. So if you go under 20, uh, sort of uh, below 23, one has to actually suspect dementia. And above 23, uh, you're generally quite fine, which is actually not the case, because you're, of course you have outliers. So adding data, um, what improve the accuracy and the test, the minimum to say, doesn't have this, uh, this, simply, this flexibility. So, if we reduce the cutoff, uh, we, will, we will increase false negatives, and if we were to increase it, we would get false positives. So in the ICA, um, we actually, um, what we do is we extract a set of informative features, and in this higher dimensional space, we use AI to find the optimal cutoffs. So in other words, a problem that cannot be solved in one dimension is mapped onto a higher dimension by the test, so it's easier to solve and benefits from big data to optimize cutoff values and classify more accurately. So I'll give you a study of our summaries from proof of concept uh, to validation and it, it might be a little bit technical so I'm going to run through them. Um, so with the ICA we aim to monitor information processing in a larger network of areas and this is sort of, sort of our first study, very, very much proof of concept. So in this slide, uh, in red, um, we show the brain areas that are affected, uh, affected uh, and activated during a task-based fMRI in healthy volunteers. Uh, people with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre-dementia condition and this population is effectively really the holy grail for dementia research. Uh, in patients uh, with uh, mild Alzheimer's. And we found that there's obviously, as you can see, there's a clear difference uh, in the level of activation between the three arms, giving us some neuroimaging basis for the discriminating power of the test. But what was more encouraging was that in the same task-based fMRI, we found that the test en engaged uh, the transenterinal cortex, the fusiform gyrus, uh, the inferior and middle temporal lobe, and these are all areas that are affected, are anatomically affected at the very earliest um, uh, stages of tau pathology, which is a classic sort of um, uh, protein that uh, is involved in what we call uh, the amyloid pet, uh, pet hypothesis of the pathogenesis of, uh, of dementia. So, which is all good which tells us that maybe the test is actually looking, is able to quantify changes in the sort of the preclinical stage. Um, but, um, hang on, yes. Uh, so that was uh, our really sort of um, our first um, sort of comparison uh, between um, uh, the test and also uh, pen and paper cognitive, um, uh, cognitive tests such as the Montreal Cognitive Assessment and the Underbrooks, which are sort of um, uh, very um, commonly used. And we showed that the test is, uh, is a little bit more accurate. Again, the sample size was, uh, was quite low. Now, um, what was though uh, actually sort of um, quite uh, sort of quite significant was that we tried to understand what are the differences uh, between how mildly impaired individuals uh, process and, and decode images to discriminate between animals and non-animals. I'll explain why it's significant. So we took 45 patients uh, with MCI and 18 uh, uh, healthy volunteers who were all gender and uh, age and education matched. They took the two um, um, typical pen and paper cognitive tests uh, and then they had the ICA test which was um, with a 64 channel EG. Uh, 
And so what we found is actually quite significant. So we see in this plot, uh, this is EEG data that is extracted 100 milliseconds before the image appears up to 800 milliseconds after the image is presented. What is uh, immediately apparent is that the speed of processing animacy is significantly delayed in people with mild cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, furthermore, the accuracy in processing animacy is also significantly reduced compared to healthy volunteers. So this is further neurophysiological indication to corroborate uh, the fMRI results. And it made us suspect that actually by targeting areas known to be affected early, the test does indeed quantify neurophysiological changes and can be clinically, a, a, and can be clinically meaningful marker of early neurodegeneration. Uh, so this was our first head-to-head -head, um, comparison between the test and, we, and the, sort of the, the test uh, shows a sort of, you know, sort of much more favorable area under the curve, sort of better accuracy, um, sort of small sample sizes, but an interesting sort of, you know, sort of a positive trend, really. Um, but the important thing is that prior to establishing sort of construct validity of the test, we wanted to test the hypothesis that the test cannot be learned. One minute, oh, all right. And the test in, is in, <laughs> independent of, uh, of education, which are, uh, which are sort of really important characteristics. So what you see um, in sort of the left graph is that uh, we gave uh, 12, 19, 25-year-old students um, college students, uh, that um, we asked them to take the test every other day for two weeks. Uh, we found that there's no statistically uh, significant practice effect after repeated exposure, which is great, and we actually replicated this in, uh, in older adults. And we also found that the correlation co coefficient for test-to-test -test reliability is high at 96%, uh, and that was for 44 participants. Uh, in a space of five weeks. So you can, you know, the, if you do it, uh, the, so the, the, the test basically replicates well if you do it uh, later on, and it's really, really important. So this slide uh, shows that compared to other tests, um, the impact of education is actually uh, minimal. Uh, and these are sort of, uh, the other tests are sort of the typical uh, standard tests, and this was really important. So all the asterisks uh, represent statistical significance. Okay, uh, and then uh, we also um, uh, sort of uh, did a head-to-head -head with, as I said, uh, uh, sort of other cognitive tests in people with MCI and AD, 100, uh, 144 participants, and we've reached a uh, accuracy of uh, zero, uh, 93 and 94 percent in terms of discriminating um, individuals who are um, um, healthy versus individuals who have MCI and AD. Um, we're validating in eight centers, uh, and we're completing the, uh, the, um, our algorithm. And the important thing is that we uh, these are the latest results. Um, again, smaller uh, sample size, we're looking at 41 healthy versus 30, 35, but it's, what is really important is that we train the algorithm in a completely different population the, the, um, compared to the one we tested it. So we actually um, trained it in an Iranian population and we're testing it in a London population, and the, and the classification model generalizes quite well. So uh, that's all for me for, for, uh, for now. The very last thing, sort of, I'm going to talk very, very quickly about sort of our pipeline. We're looking at um, going from substantial equivalence or uh, sort of uh, proving that the test actually does what it says on the tin to our main hypothesis, which is prediction. Uh, and um, we are looking. We we are we are trialing the test in um, older uh, health individuals who are community uh, dwelling, and um, and we are looking at predicting whether they will develop MCI in the next few years. And this is really important. And at the same time, we're uh, we're looking at improving um, uh, both the referral rates from uh, primary care to secondary care when it comes to um, referrals for dementia and also to try to follow up individuals at home. There's a huge population, which is the MCI population, and 
the NHS in the UK that is not followed up, and these are the people who will develop a dementia who are at the moment really effectively lost in sort of, you know, the, um, in, in the system. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm you know, sorry I've sort of run over. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And uh, we're slightly over time, so there is time for one question only. Me too. Thank you. Thank you for that. Is um, is a goal the de-implementation of the MMSC? So, so, what do I mean by that? De the MMSC is a very poor test psychometrically, very crude. You've already said it's sensitive to, to education. Um, do you think with uh, this pipeline, you could stop people using it? <laughs> Absolutely, and we hope so. Uh, and we're sort of, you know, this, sort of, this is a space that is actually sort of quickly, rapidly changing, mainly because of the financial implications uh, of dementia, both for patients and their families and carers. So actually, in primary care, GPs tend to even avoid uh, the mini mental state examination because it takes a long time. So that's, that's problematic with an average of seven minutes per patient and a test that takes 10 to 15 minutes. You can, you can, you, you, you can do the maths, but also it's not just because it's, it takes time, it's also because, it's, as, you, as you mentioned, it's generally quite inaccurate, quite crude. And it, it basically, it, this sort of the mini mental state and pretty much all the pen and paper tests are based on uh, research, uh, which is sort of anywhere between 50 to 25 years old. And they're pri primarily focusing on memory and the questions around memory are questions that if one doesn't necessarily, if one doesn't answer, then you know that the, that, that the condition is actually bordering on, you know, sort of the severe end of the spectrum. So it's, you know, way too late, both for research or treatment. Uh, thank you very much again. I see that there are more questions, but please approach to Chris during the break. Yeah, you can approach me if you want to do the test. I mean, that's why. Oh, so you can uh, <laughs> approach me after the. Yeah. Thank you again. Bye. And uh, our next, our next speaker is Jelko Kraljevic. Uh, he's a research fellow at the Department of Biostatistics and Health Informatics, and he will tell us something about unsupervised learning. <laughs> it opens in, yeah, but it opens in Explorer. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, uh, I am Jelko and I'll be presenting the medical concept annotation tool MedCat. So I'll just start with a simple overview of electronic health records and what's the problem there with unstructured data. I'll present how we can solve this using MedCat, how we have validated the tool, show some simple results and summarize with some use cases. So a very large amount of data is contained in electronic health records. And the problem is that it's usually free text. So clinicians can easily understand that by reading the documents and finding diseases, symptoms, medications, or anything like that. But the problem is when we want to use this for machine learning or for statistical analysis, the problem is that it, we cannot do this without structuring the data. And even though in natural language processing or in machine learning, there are some ways like entity recognition that can structure the data, there are some difficulties in the medical field. The first one being the number of concepts. Usually when we do entity recognition, we maybe have a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand concepts. But here in UMLS, so Unified Medical Language System, we have around 2.4 million different concepts. And a lot of them are very ambiguous. So it's possible that one concept can have three or 400 different names, or even that one name is linked to a couple of hundred different diseases. And finally, the problem is privacy. 
a lot of machine learning needs training, and here it is very difficult to get to the data so that it can be trained. So to solve some of these problems, uh, we are presenting, or we have created MedCat, which consists of two main tasks. So the first task has been concept annotation, meaning let's find what's important inside of a record like this one, and second one, concept classification. So concept annotation would mean this. For each important disease or um, symptom or medication, we annotate it inside of the health record and we'll link it to a database, so like UMLS, like SNOMED, or something like that. And finally, we also want some additional information, usually on top of that, because we want to detect, oh, was the concept negated, or uh, is the experience of the patient, or a family member, or something like that. So this is the second portion of MedCat, which is concept classification. Now, I'll go a bit deeper into each one of these. So concept annotation requires us to have a concept database to which we will link the found annotations and, of course, some documents. So some concepts are very easy to detect. Like here, the first two, hours and heart rate, it's easy to know that they are linked to heart rate and to hour. But the third one, HR, is ambiguous. It can link to both heart rate and hour. Here, we use an unsupervised approach, so pretty much for MedCat, we do not need any training or any labeled data. It learns, or it, uh, it has a neural network that learns the context in which concepts appear so that it can automatically disambiguate and link the detections to the right, um, to the right concept in the database. This is pretty much done in the way that it learns from obvious examples so that the ones that are not obvious can be disambiguated to show that this in fact works. Uh, in the first, in the top image, we see HR uh, correctly detected as heart rate, and in the second example as hour. Um, in the bottom here, we show that um, it's possible to detect different ways of writing a concept. So kidney failure written in four different ways, also with uh, spelling mistakes or um, yeah, any of that is still tagged correctly as uh, kidney failure. This was needed because spelling mistakes or abbreviations or all of that is fairly common in uh, health records. And finally, in the big table, we just show that compared to other, other tools, uh, we perform significantly better pretty much in all metrics available. Now, the second task, classification, requires supervised learning because it can also be that the negation for um, one clinician is not the same as the negation for another clinician, or uh, historical mentions are not the same between two clinicians, so this is why um, there is a pre-trained version available, but also if you want to customize it for your use case, you need to annotate some examples. So here we use a deep learning language model. In fact, we use an AW, AWLSTM and also um, a BERT from Google. Uh, we embed pretty much a document with respect to a detected concept so that the deep learning model can understand, oh, is this related to a patient or is it negated or any of that. We also show two simple validations on the MIMIC data and on the CRIS data set. Finally, while MedCat is running, in the background it also calculates embeddings for concepts. Pretty much we represent the concepts or diseases as uh, high dimensional vectors. This allows us now to either project them in a space like in the image, which allows us to see, okay, other diseases are usually grouped together. Um, ex for example, if you take the concept seizure, we'll see everything related to the concept seizure in one place. And we can also do things like, given a concept like fever, give us the most similar medications to this concept based on vector similarity, and we get a list of uh, medications that are used to train fever. The same can be done pretty much for any other disease, and what we saw is that the most frequent medications that are given for that uh, disease or symptom appear as the most similar ones. Um, we also show that it captures more medical knowledge than just basic similarity, because we can do uh, kidney failure minus kidney plus heart gives us the concept for heart failure. The same can be done with diseases. And it's important here to notice that these are not word embeddings, so it's not a word represented uh, as a vector, but the whole concept. That's why, for example, we have 
um, two embeddings for the HR because one is related to heart rate, one is related to um, hour. Finally, while we are running, we also calculate a co-occurrence matrix, which now allows us to pretty much, given a data set, find the most frequent concepts or find relation between concepts. So understand, for example, uh, in the MIMIC data set, um, given some diseases, what are the most frequent corresponding symptoms? Um, same can be done for medications or anything else. This is also possible because um, we can annotate pretty much millions of documents in a day on a pretty much personal PC. So that's why we can easily calculate large scale statistics. Okay, so those were the use cases. Now there are a couple of ways how MedCat can be used. First of all, of course, it's open source, so uh, you can do whatever you want with the code. It's available as a web service over a REST API, so you send a document and you receive back annotations. As a Python package, which can be just installed and used in Python, it's also part of Clockstack, meaning that all the documents that are ingested by Clockstack inside of a hospital can now receive annotations, be saved back into Clockstack, so that clinicians or researchers can now easily filter and say, give me all patients that have a certain concept or a certain disease or these disease plus these symptoms plus whatever we want. Uh, and finally, it's also available as a web application. In fact, two web applications. The first one allows us to um, enter some text, click annotate and get all the annotations. Um, it also allows us if there was a mistake to send back feedback, so do active or online learning. Uh, or create new concepts if something was missed. The second one allows us to train uh, meta annotations, so to now classify by is it historical or negation or whatever class we want. In fact, this is not limited to some uh, classes. You can create your own classes and just do the classification and after 100 examples, Metcalf will do that by itself. So to summarize, um, Medcat is a tool to organize and structure uh, text from electronic health records. It currently performs faster and better than the, all the existing tools. Uh, it's open source, easy to use. Pretty much in a couple of minutes, it's possible to install it and have it ready. Uh, we have it deployed at uh, Slam at KCH for various use cases, and it provides state-of-the-art results. Thank you very much for the attention and yeah, questions. Too. Thank you, Jelko, and this very interesting talk. Uh, questions? Hmm? Anybody? Oh, sorry, Chris. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jelko. I'm slightly offended that um, it's been used in, uh, at the Mosley and you're not using it uh, in patients with dementia. You said cognitive impairment in schizophrenia? Yeah. How come? <laughs> this, is a, this is a valuable tool. No, that's true. We, we just started with this project, so it's, I think we put it in Modley maybe a month ago. Yes. So it's, everything is fairly new. So of course, we'll make it available for any other use case there is. Thank you. If there are no more questions, we will stop here. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you all the speakers. And then we are having a break. And because we are a bit over time, please come back no later than 4.20. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you all for coming back. We need to um, crack on. We need to continue with our session and our next speaker is actually keynote, uh, another keynote uh, uh, speaker. Uh, the, uh, she's um, Jessica Morley and she's an AI subject matter expert at NH, NSH. X. It's N -H -S. a N H. It's, you know, it's so difficult to pronounce for me. So, and this X apparently doesn't stand for anything. There is no kind of abbreviation. So, I hope that Jessica will explain everything to us because obviously I cannot even pronounce it. Thank you, Jessica, for coming, and the stage is yours. people hear me? All right. Um, hi, so I am Jess Morley. I am a very weird hybrid of a person, um, and I tend to work for organizations that have very strange sounding names. Um, so I am a researcher at the Oxford Internet Institute in the Digital Ethics Lab. Uh, contrary to its name, it's literally just another department of the University of Oxford. They just decided to call it an institute because, I, because it's cooler. I don't know. Um, <laughs> NHS X. We are literally just the NHS, but we're all of the staff from Department of Health and Social Care, NHS England, and NHS Improvement, who do digital data and technology policy. Um, we came into being in around April of this year to try and streamline the way that those decisions are made across all of those different organizations, but the work streams that have been, I will talk some of them about, have been ongoing for closer to three years. So the work is longer than the in existing unit. We should be very clear that we're a unit. We are not another Department of Health. We are not another uh, arm's length body. We're just a team who's branded with X. The X does stand for user experience. So we're like UX, NHX, X. Um, so this will be a little bit of a mixture of me, essentially, but some of it's NHS X work, some of it is my work. We kind of just blend into one we'll go with it. Uh, so some things, I'm not going to talk so much about this because you've already had some really good use cases already this morning, um, but, or this afternoon, but the first session of this afternoon. How might AI hurt? How do we govern it? Um, and how do we go about making it happen um, for reality? So this is just a very, very high level overview of where we look at inside NHS AI having some form of impact. <laughs> Um, I won't read those things because you can all read, but if we're going from left to right, you're talking about things that are currently available roughly now in pilot or proof of concept stage through to where hypothesis is going as to where we might end up. Um, so we have obviously quite a big responsibility in the center if we're developing the governance mechanisms for how all of this stuff works to understand what's going on. Um, what's being built. So we have run for the last two years what's called the State of the Nation or the State of the Ecosystem Survey. We've had about 170 plus companies respond to say what they're building, how they're building it, why they're building it. Um, so you can see over here the main aim, these are this year's results, the report is a massive report. I think it's called something hilarious like AI, how do we get it right? Which I feel like is a really overly bold claim. Um, but that's the report that will come out in October. But as a high level view, you can see that most people are kind of focused on diagnostic. It makes sense. Um, it's because of the structured nature of imaging. Um, it's kind of the low hanging fruit. Also machine learning already knows how to do that. Like it's makes sense. Over here, these are really small, so sorry, but it's effectively saying that people are primarily focused on delivering tools that help clinicians make diagnostic decisions in secondary care for the purposes of improving system efficiency. Um, the system efficiency per point is really important to me uh, because often you will hear with the AI, because of the amount of hype that surrounds all of this, really big massive extremes. Either AI is gonna solve absolutely everything, no one is ever going to die 
ever again because we have all of the data problem solved, or you'll hear it and say, all we're gonna do is augment clinicians. So we're just making it so that clinicians have more time so that they can look you in the eye when, they're, when you're in the room and the AI will do everything in the background. We probably, in different parts of the care pathway, doing different tasks, a mixture of those two things. Probably not the saving people from dying thing, but it's about optimizing the system and making sure that it runs in the most efficient manner. Um, so this is gonna be no shock to most people in this room because you are all switched on. But the media, everyone, particularly programs and people who like to get big hype will always tell you that we are right down in that bottom already. Um, basically, with, you know, we've got robots are doing stuff, we have AI clinicians, they can predict things already. Whereas in reality, most of that stuff is really far away. And even here, right at the top, um, most of these things that we see in the NHS world anyway are proof of concepts and in research as opposed to being deployed large scale at, at scale. Um, and this is quite important from us from a perspective of adoption. If you want to get clinicians on board, if we want to start the stuff actually having an impact, it needs to start having an impact on frontline and people to start seeing the benefits of these types of technologies. At the moment when it's so far away from impacting people on the frontline, I think we are at risk of people just n disengaging. Um, at some point. This kind of reiterates that. This is again from our survey. So we ask people who are developing, how likely do you think it is that you will be ready for at scale deployment, bearing in mind all of the ethical, regulatory and legal hoops that you need to jump through and the evidence requirements that we have put in place um, on a one to three and five year time scale. This is not showing anything other than common sense more people think that they'll be ready in five years than they, people think that they'll be ready in one. Um, but even in this one year space, where you have got the vast majority, well, not the vast majority, but you do have a lot, a lot of people saying that they're unlikely to be ready, I also suspect are wrong and or lying. Um, so <laughs> we will see. This is how can AI hurt? Now this is primarily where my own research sits, but it's also how we focus in NHS X. It's our responsibility not to implement. We're not responsible for building. We're not responsible for implementing. Lots of people come up to us and are like, how do I get hold of the data? It's so hard. I'm like, yes, for a reason. <laughs> um, so we, we are responsible for creating the frameworks largely to prevent some of these harms. Um, we have the ultimate responsibility to protect patient safety. That does have a two-pronged aspect to it because it means we have to keep people safe. It also means we have a responsibility to look at the technologies that can deliver patient benefit and make sure that they do get into the NHS. So we're kind of balancing on a knife edge. Um, but these are the harms here. Um, people who aren't philosophers, epistemic, normative, overarching, this is based on a previous paper around the ethics of algorithms in general, and then what we did was build and look at how the ethics of algorithms for health um, specific might have a problem. So I won't talk through all of these because that would be super tedious for you. But if we look at the top box of epistemic concerns, this is largely to do with the quality of the evidence. So you've already heard some people talk um, this morning, uh, or this, you know what I mean. When I say this morning, I mean the before break. <laughs> Uh, around inconclusive evidence, uh, so do we know that it actually works? Like most of this stuff, again, like I said, is working in hyper-constrained environments. As soon as we try and deploy it into a real-life environment, you're getting nowhere near as close to the results. Um, a really good example is we've had uh, a very well, very well-designed, C, properly CE-marked uh, mammography screening um, algorithm. It was developed in Hungary, um, turns out hungry British boobs not the same, um, largely because uh, the NHS has got a more diverse population. So as soon as you start trying to take it out um, of those environments, we're having a problem. Inscrutable evidence is the partly to do with the issue with black boxes, um, which actually I really, really enjoyed the answer given earlier about around accuracy versus um, interpretability. What we're concerned about is not necessarily just the 
explainability of the algorithm itself, the specific algorithm. It's the, our ability as the center of the system to know how these things are being developed and more evidence-based, and particularly when there is such a drive at the moment from all aspects of the sector, including academic publishing, to be the new thing, the new thing, the new thing, the new thing, the new thing. There is no incentive to for reproducibility. This starts causing us a bit of a problem. Um, and it causes us a problem because if we don't have an oversight of the evidence, um, then really we start to lose our ability to be able to mitigate some of these risks with regards to unfair outcomes or transformative effects. Uh, so this to point to come back to is that the NHS's constitution um, is founded on the principle that we are for everyone. There's a very real risk that we make that less true than it is now with the introduction of these technologies. That is not to say that the NHS currently delivers equal care for everybody. It doesn't. I would be lying if I said that it did. Um, we know that, but there is a problem or a very real risk that we exacerbate that quite dramatically. Transformative effects means a little bit <laughs> as a slightly more conceptually airy-fairy, I guess. But it's this I, uh, the idea that if you have what's called your integrity of self, so I know who I am, I understand how decisions are being made about me, I can understand how I influence those decisions. And as soon as you start moving all of those decisions about someone's healthcare, which traditionally has been a very physical, kinesthetic thing, like I am embodied in myself into the data space, that causes a disconnect between the data and the physical person, and that can be quite transformative for the, how that person feels. So a simple example is if you're talking about Fitbits, um, they basically work by trying, or Fitbits or any of those types of things, essentially are working by trying to push people towards a baseline. So we expect you to have a heart rate of this. We expect you to have this many steps in a day. We try and do this. Most of those base mar benchmarks are based on hyper-biased data. They may be completely irrelevant for that individual. That they might start having all sorts of impacts in terms of how that person perceives their health and how an individual system perceives that person's health as well. But particularly people who have lower levels of e-health literacy, in order for them to understand that process, it's quite a leap. So we have to be aware of how this stuff is happening. Um, and then overarching issues is just when we start to have the big knotty problems that everyone always asks me about, like liability. Um, where does the liability sit? Uh, we normally want in a healthcare system to have what you would call distributed responsibility. So you have each individual node in the system, we know what that node is responsible for. So that if, we, if something goes right, we know exactly how to replicate it. If something goes wrong, we know how to stop it from happening again. As soon as you're in this system of algorithmic healthcare, that the number of nodes involved in that system is so much bigger than we have ever dealt with before. Because do we know, is it from the data? Is it the inputting of the data? Is it, that, is it how the data was formatted? Is it the decision of the model that was made? Is it how the, com the clinician interacted with that particular system? There are suddenly huge numbers of more questions, which causes us at the center a lot of concern. By the way, nobody has the answer yet. All the lawyers just tell me until there's case law, which basically means until it happens, we don't know what the answer is uh, as to who is responsible if an algorithm kills somebody. Uh, so this is something that we tried to do again in the survey to ask, have people started considering some of these ethical considerations? Like, have you got a separate data set for validating? Do you have a rationale for how you have made your system in, um, understandable? Have you assessed your data for bias? A lot of people are saying yes. There are people over here who are saying no or I don't know primarily say it's because they are too early. They're too early in the development phase. My answer is we probably worded the questions they should have all been intending instead of in the present tense because you should be considering these things from the beginning of development even if you haven't. Um, I also would imagine that some of these people who are saying yes are lying because they think we're the government and we're policing them. Um, <laughs> you can tell I'm like super positive about all of this stuff. <laughs> so how can you assess the where we might have levels of, of impact and concern that we need to monitor? 
to have various different levels of abstraction. So you, you might want to think about the individual, you might want to think about interpersonal, so how is this in the interaction, the development of these technologies in the NHS affecting relationships between patients and clinicians, between clinicians and healthcare providers, between clinicians and innovators. We are introducing a way more agencies that have ever interacted with the NHS than previously. Um, how does it have an impact on the group? So do we start to know way more about people like me, who I'm on my phone all the time, I have a Fitbit, I, I'm quite into self-tracking and all of this kind of stuff, despite the fact that I then look at all of the evil ways that data could be used. Um, and we know much more about them than we know about other people. Uh, institutional, this is primarily about public trust. So the NHS is the most publicly trusted institution in the UK. It's like the most loved. All you need to do is go back and watch the Olympics opening ceremony and you'll get quite how much strongly the British people feel about the NHS. But if we start introducing these technologies too soon or too slow and you lose the public trust in the institution to capitalise on technology as an um, or to capitalize it on the wrong way, we have lost something quite profound at that point. And societal, again, is partly linked to this group effect. Um, do we start to change things like social norms because of the introduction of algorithmic healthcare? So something I talk about quite a bit, the law is the floor. Right, so the law is the absolute minimum of what we would expect people to do. So they call on here the minimum viable ethical product, um, because the law tells you consent and anonymization. You're golden. I, I can tell you. Number one, when do you consent? Who do you consent? How frequently do you consent? People, do people even understand what it is that they are consenting to? Number two, anonymization. Does an algorithm really care if it knows your name? Two, if you are aggregating data sets, how likely is it that you could re-identify that person? So it's fairly rudimentary guidance. Uh, we should be doing a lot more. Uh, so how do you go about doing this? Is what we call the difference between soft and hard ethics. Ethics is everything above the law. Regulation and law and stuff is the floor, like we've just said and then you build from there. So the main space we work in is in this middle space, policies and standards, that's what the responsibility of the government is, but it should be informed by ethics, and ethics is informed by what we call social preferability. So it's not just social acceptability, it's social preferability. So there's a difference um, between what people think, ah, oh, it's all right, versus yes, I think that's what we should be doing. So we do a lot to try and elicit what we might call this social requirements for ethical and safe deployments of AI and healthcare to then inform everything else. Uh, regulation we have been working on, I'm not going to talk about it so much, but we've been working on it for like two to three years. It's very slow, partly because regulation is slow, partly because government lawyers are really distracted and I don't know why. <laughs> um, so what are the things that we need to consider when we are, we are making these policies and these standards? Data access, data protection, accountability, evidence, and trust. This paper says that trust is the outcome of the four things above it. I think that's partly true, but I also think you have to proactively seek trust, not assume that it is just an outcome of doing the right things. So there's a number of different things going on uh, in these different spaces, as you can see. We've just had the Digital Innovation Hubs. So they were launched last week as part of HDR UK, which is Health Data Research UK. Um, we've got various things under data protection and accountability and evidence I will talk about more in a second. So the first thing we did was develop this thing, it's called the Code of Conduct for Data-Driven Health and Care Technologies, um, because we wanted to make it like short and snappy. Um, and it's made up of 10 high-level principles or 10 high-level behaviours of what we expect people to do if you are developing these tools and technologies. This is version one. Um, we launched it in February of this year. We are currently revising it, and we will revise it till hopefully around the end of this year, uh, political climate allowing. Um, it will probably maybe a little bit shorter. Um, but of these, about seven of them, or six of them, or no, seven, 
are existing. So they would, what we did was just to try and bring together all of the really hyper-confusing guidance around information governance, um, all of that type of stuff into one place. So you can see, like, understand your users, that's fairly basic. But principles seven, eight, and 10 are brand new. So principle seven is the sort of explainability one slash the ethical analysis one. We've just completed a about six months piece of research developing a how-to guide. Um, so that will come out in the revised version of the code, but also as a paper uh, in an academic journal. Number eight, this is live. This is generate evidence of effectiveness um, for the intended use and value of money. Um, that has standards now that are available on a nice website around the evidence that we need to, to see to, in order to demonstrate that a digital health technology works. Um, it doesn't yet include machine learning. So it does not include any algorithm that continues to develop. It goes up to and includes static algorithms. We are currently developing the guideline for a machine learning algorithm. Um, it's based on risk. So there are tiers of risk depending on whether you're just an app that reminds people just to drink water every half an hour versus whether you're some form of clinical decision support software. And then the last new one was define the commercial strategy. This tends to be the bit that we get hit by a lot by government um, as to did we just give Google data for free? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of work going on around what does that look like? There are a number of principles. The first one is make sure that it's a reciprocal value. It's probably a little bit too weak because the reciprocal value can mean anything. Um, but what we are doing is working with uh, some citizens' juries are doing participatory democracy to understand what do citizens feel is acceptable models of um, commercial deals for data use. The intention is that we develop enough governance policies and regulation that we have oversight of the whole entire AI deployment cycle, right from um, deployment, development, deployment, and use. Um, different parts of the system will have different parts of responsibility for that. And that's where we're ev eventually going to get to. We call it regulation as a service. So we'll see. This is just the US FDA one. You can look it up online. Our version of what we are trying to create is down at the bottom, but you can see where we have some gaps. Um, the biggest one being that we have lots of regulators, but none of them talk to each other. And the risks appear in the gaps between the handoffs of the regulators. Uh, so we said about this. So this is the last thing I talk about. This we announced over the summer. Um, NHSX is uh, an uh, NHS AI lab. Uh, to say it's in an embryonic state would probably be overstating it. It's probably an unfertilized egg. But we, the, uh, the idea is that we will hopefully start to be able to actually actively promote and the further development the regulation and the work that we have already been doing um, and test ideas. So to conclude. We have to ignore the hype. Um, we have to build solid foundations. We need to educate the workforce and citizens. We need to model the impact so we know what's going to happen. We need to continuously monitor the system so that if something changes, we can, in we can interfere. And we need to provide support to all the nodes in the system. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, first, for this very interesting talk. Second, for being on time. Uh, this is really important. Uh, thank you very much. And it's really interesting to hear also the other side uh, of the medal. Uh, so let's hear some questions from the audience, please. Uh, George? Uh, one of the things that I see many times when talking to government is that there's always this criteria that um, let's say AI systems, whatever they do, mm -hmm. um, they need to be valid for money. Yeah. Um, and what I find interesting about that is when you look into the pharmaceutical industry, that is also a requirement, but not pre-market, it's a post-market requirement. Mm -hmm. And when I see these being discussed at government level, it seems like everyone wants to shoehorn this as a pre-market requirement. You first mm -hmm. need to demonstrate value before you even reach market, yeah. which creates yet another catch-22, like there's hundreds of them, of how do you demonstrate value if you have not reached market? So some, how do you solve this conundrum where clearly NHS doesn't want to invest in something that is not the value, mm -hmm. but for you to demonstrate value, you need to be able to deploy the thing? That's a, um, that's a really, really, really good question. Uh, we have partly not been helped in that discussion by um, 
apologies if anyone worked for them. Uh, Accenture published a report that says that NHS's data is worth 10 billion pounds. Um, this has got the Treasury's head in an absolute spin. Um, and so therefore, every time we have literally been having this live discussion around the creation of the lab, they're like, well, what technologies do you want to support? Which ones have the most um, ROI? And then I'm saying, well, none of them, we don't know because they're, they're too early in, in the chain. Um, there are some things that we can do around test bedding is one, one example, if we create a test bed, you generally don't have to have proved your economic impact to be a test bed, and that's what those standards for evidence say. They, they also have economic impact statements. Um, there are options in there for if you are further ahead, so or if you are too early in the chain, for example, to start looking at uh, the, what are your projected impacts but we also moved away or the thing that we have actively tried to do is move away from the phrase value of data or value of money to benefits of because you might actually be talking about clinical outcome and for us for me and my colleague Indra who run the AI program it's the outcome that we care about um, it's, that's quite a big shift for higher up levels of government um, and I think the only way we can do it is by continuing to do what we do, like go out and talk to people, find really good case studies of, of really excellent research that's going on and kind of show case it. But it's an uphill battle, I would say. Hello, thank you for a lecture, it's very good. Uh, what I was thinking is, uh, of course there is a, a gap between the academic production of uh, AI systems and the commercial production of, because anything can, can build a mental health app or anything. And, uh, and I, I would like to apologize for my ignorance about this, about what I'm about to ask because I have just arrived uh, here in the UK. But are you thinking about uh, what could be done is like some uh, NHS uh, uh, proved seal for uh, for uh, an app but to run for the public because uh, we are much more controlled in our projects than an ordinary uh, business is. We have to submit uh, our reports uh, to a scientific uh, uh, community and the, the general business does not. That there's quite a set process versus developers from industry who are coming in and not thinking that they're doing human research, thinking I am doing user research and product development. So part of the point of creating the code was in order to create that, and we have now, when we refresh the code and it goes live in December, there is actually a live website version of it called the self-assurance portal where people can go in and answer questions, so not just did you do this, but how did you do this that the NHS can log in and see and provide um, some feedback on that. In terms of like creating a seal of approval type thing, we actually did a piece of um, research looking specifically at that question. We have the NHS apps library, which only has apps on it which have been approved by the NHS for quite a strict process in order to get through it. We have also failed with it in the past. We had to shut it down once because they didn't meet privacy requirements, but we're just going to skip over that. Um, so we tried to do the same thing looking at whether we did that for algorithms. The problem is what are you approving? The company, the specific product, the specific range of product, how frequently do you need to check whether that algorithm is working? Um, and so the, the sort of result of the research was that it's too early in the phase of development of AI for healthcare to start looking at that. Instead, what we want to do is be really transparent about what frameworks are in place so that people have enough trust in the wider ecosystem to believe that if something has been deployed at the NHS at scale, that it has been through enough um, of a process, but that online portal that I described a second ago will be available to all commissioners who are procuring systems, so they'll be able to review the evidence. 
Any other question for Jessica? If not, thank you again, Jessica. Really interesting talk. And now we are continuing with Ivana Popovic, and um, it's actually a very curious and really good move because she's a representative of the, again, abbreviation NIHR. And there she is, and I really do have to read this, I'm sorry, Senior Business Development Manager at the NIHR, Office for Clinical Research Infrastructure. So we're really looking forward to hear more. Hi, uh, can you actually, this working? Should be. Yeah, it should be on. Okay. Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, so, Thank you for inviting me. It's actually nice to come back to King's. I was here for five years on the fourth floor working at developmental neurobiology. So I do have a neuroscience background, but I have nothing to do with AI except that I do a lot of business with AI companies. So just for those who are not aware of NIHR, because we are very much in the clinical space, we are basically a government funded agency that has an aim of improving health and wealth of the nation in the UK. We are the largest funder of clinical research that no one heard about. Um, we support translational research and management of clinical trials across the country. And uh, we do this through NHS trusts and partner universities. Uh, we are given around one billion a year that we then distribute to the universities and hospitals. A large part of that money goes to so-called infrastructure grants, which basically fund the clinical research facilities and they fund the researchers, the portion of their time to do clinical translational research on the new technologies. Uh, we also provide funding for training, for research programs, and we also fund genomics England. One of the key things that we actually support is collaboration between the researchers. So we do this through something called translational research collaborations, which are basically ready formed group of universities and attached hospitals that do clinical research in a certain disease area. Uh, these collaborations are set up to do collaborative work amongst themselves, but also to work with charities and with industry partners to deliver clinical trials. So two of the new collaborations in this space are dementia and mental health. You will be pleased to know that mental health collaboration is actually managed from King's. Uh, dementia is uh, managed actually from Newcastle, but King's is very active participant in this collaboration. So just to show you who the centers are, there are around 10 universities in the UK that are part of one or the other or both of the collaborations. And they also have attached mental health research centers, clinical research facilities, and other centers of excellence in the UK. These two collaborations work on, in dementia space, obviously, on all of the dementias, on Parkinson's, including progression to dementia, neuroinflammation, and Huntington's. Mental health has focused their res uh, collaboration has focused their research on mood disorders and particularly on uh, treatment resistant depression and also early psychosis. But they're also working quite a lot on supporting uh, the cohorts through NIHR bioresource. So um, I guess some of you have probably heard about the GLAD study, which is uh, a study ran from the uh, Kings uh, that is. Uh, delivered through the bioresource. So how do we actually work with industry through NIHR? We do three things. First is access to expertise and facilities. So let's say a company comes and says, I really want to do this piece of research and I want to do it in the UK. They come to us, we talk to them, and we help them find the collaborators. So we contact the universities where we know that the PIs are working on something similar. We contact the clinical research facilities that are doing trials in that space and say, who is interested? And then people come back to us and say, I propose we do this and that with this company. So we kind of match make in this space. Another thing we do is when people actually agree to do a study collaboratively, we support the setup and delivery of the trial. So we have 
uh, operational groups that do the clinical trial uh, delivery through the NIHR. And we fund research. So we have funding available both for the universities and for the uh, companies that are interested in doing clinical research in the UK with the aim of bringing those technologies to NHS. So going back, to, going back basically to the AI in the industri uh, industry in healthcare, we know that healthcare is becoming increasingly one of the key areas where AI technologies are used. Companies are developing uh, AI-based um, products for, for everything from fitness, clinical trials, diagnostics, and so on. US is definitely leading in this market. Uh, if you look at the things as how much funding from both from public and private sector is coming in, a uh, number of companies that are fo uh, founded in the each country and numbers of patents, US is leading and leaving everyone else quite far behind. Another two countries that are really prominent are China. The reason for that is a lot of uh, investment and also the government there is actively promoting public and private partnerships. And um, finally, the third one is UK. The main two reasons besides the very strong academic community why UK is the third leading country in this space at the moment is first, patient data available through the NHS. Many countries don't have this system and don't have a centralized way of accessing anonymized data. And the second one is government investment. So for those of you who still watch news, you will notice in the last couple of months, well, a year, there has been several announcements around AI. We already heard about um, artificial National Artificial Intelligence Lab. Um, also, our Prime Minister has announced just last month that there's gonna be additional 250 million pounds invested. We don't really sh know how and where, but it's a good will. <laughs> so going to the um, AI, start, uh, AI industry itself, I didn't want to base this talk around DeepMind and Googles and all the big players because I think where the opportunity for academic researchers is, is small companies. And the reason for that is that they're much earlier stage of the development and they're much more open to collaboration. Also, if you work with a small company that doesn't have that clinical expertise or academic expertise, you can really shape their research and you can make decisions together with them on where the project is going to go. So if we look at the AI companies, uh, across the different areas in healthcare, um, almost third of them, and this is new AI companies in the last three years, almost third of them is in imaging and diagnostics. This is predominantly in cancer, but there is quite a few new companies that are focusing on uh, neuroscience as well. The second most popular group is uh, drug discovery, and this basically includes companies that use their AI-based um, technology to identify either new candidates or the new combination of compounds that then they can either develop uh, in their in-house R&D or what they usually do is go to a bigger company and license it to them to de develop it further. Then there is predictive analytics and risk scoring for various patient groups. Genomics, I don't need to explain. You know about virtual assistants, also hospital decision support, and this is something which is very strong in the UK, where uh, data-driven AI technology is used to either make the decisions in the uh, clinics or to actually help automate the opera operations within the hospital. Um, also, one thing where uh, there's quite a few companies in the UK that are doing quite well is mo ro remote mo monitoring where the companies are co collecting data from wearables, uh, home devices or implantables and analyze that uh, for the clinicians. Um, and just to mention mental health, there is one company that is very prominent at the moment and I'm gonna say a little bit more about that later. Um, so. Just going to neurotechnology in general, what does it include? Uh, it's anything from 
uh, machine brain interfaces, prosthetics, stimulation, monitoring, implantable devices, and so on. I'm not going to read that. Um, there's quite a lot of companies that have started coming in the last few years. Some of them, like MindStrong, are working on um, measuring, uh, using me measuring technologies to predict mental illness. Kernel is doing, again, uh, measuring, but uh, using the stimulus from multiple neurons to uh, predict uh, how the system works, and they're planning to use this for dementia and AI treatment. Then you can see here three companies that are um, doing uh, research on implantables. Uh, Think uh, is uh, working on prosthetics uh, for uh, people with paralysis, so they would be able to control their own um, uh, mobi uh, mobility assistive devices. Synchrotron is doing that for, uh, for amputees, and BIOS is a Cambridge company that is also working in that space uh, for the paralysis. Um, there's actually quite a lot of companies. Uh, some of them are doing treatment, for instance, for things like epileptic seizures or for chronic pain. Uh, quite a few, as I said, are doing uh, uh, imaging uh, in uh, neurology. I'm not going to go in too much details about that. I wanted to mention just a few case studies so you get an idea how to actually do these things as collaborations. So we were recently approached by a company called Biomind. This is the Singaporean deep tech company, and they built predictive uh, AI ap applications for healthcare. Their first product uh, was a C-certified AI application for brain diagnosis. They're doing uh, everything from uh, tumors uh, to stroke and uh, vascular diseases. They have come to us and said, we would really like to do a clinical trial in the UK. Can you help us? We have sent their um, proposal to all of the universities that are part of our network. And now they're talking to two universities in the UK and setting up that study. Another thing to mention is, so in a different space, in the drug development is benevolent AI. I think quite a few of you know about them. So I, on purpose, didn't choose case studies from Kings because you would know, but they're also working with Sheffield on a um, drug development program where they have used their candidates and are taking them into the clinics for validation uh, through uh, the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience. And lastly, as uh, an example of doing things the opposite way, Psych and Study, where also uh, Kings is part of it, it's a large multi center I think there's 20 centers across the world uh, working on developing a neuroimaging based tool and they have collected a large amounts of various data that they are using uh, to uh, influence development of schizophrenia. Uh, later on, three, four companies have joined in and are now working together with that team uh, to build an uh, iPad based prediction tool. They have three products that are currently in development. So things can go the other way around as well. And I'm going to end there, not to bore you too much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. This was really novel, and at least for me. Thank you for the information. Questions for this audience? Hmm? Thank you. Uh, you said you would talk more about the MindStrong uh, app. Uh, can you talk a little more about that, what the MindStrong is about? So we haven't worked with MindStrong. I'm aware of them because people talk about them a lot. They're basically uh, using uh, measuring uh, to be able, uh, so measuring uh, single neuron electrical st stimulus to uh, build a system that will allow them to uh, detect mental illnesses before they happen. It's very hard, for quite a few of these companies, it's very hard to find actual background about the technology itself and any testing they have done. Uh, they are not the worst, but they're quite up there with, because at the moment they're valued quite highly, so it's not very easy to find more data about it. 
Yes, oh, you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm actually, uh, thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm actually very interested in AI uh, applied directly to the research process. Uh, so a review came out this summer looking at AI applied to clinical trial optimization, uh, matching patients to clinical trials using patient registries and the clinical trial registries. I was just wondering how much, or sort of if any, the NIHR had input or were uh, doing that themselves. So NIHR doesn't really influence how the research is going. We award the money in the teams, and then researchers decide what they're going to spend it on. Uh, if you're looking at clinical trials and matching patients to the actual trial, uh, actually Manchester uh, is doing quite a lot of this in this space, being funded by NIHR to do this, where they're matching uh, patients with terminal cancers uh, to the clinical trials uh, based on the, the genetics data and also on their overall clinical data. So we do support that research, but we don't really make decisions around how researchers are going to be working in this space. So they have lots of freedom, basically. Yeah. Well, once they get money. Uh, once, yeah, <laughs> of course. There is always one but. Um, more questions? I assume that your email inbox will be full of emails after Please this. Uh, you know, you put your email there, so. Okay. Uh, oh, one more question. If you can go back to the slide where you had uh, the different apps going to this? yeah so where do you see the greatest challenge like as in would it be apps that diagnose or diagnose issues or would you what would you say is the greatest need right now from from, from scientific point of view or from kind of solving the healthcare challenges so in the sense like, would it be apps that diagnose or apps that kind of help people who, who already have issues or, I think like, in that it, sense? Yeah, it, it becomes a bit more ethical question. If you diagnose something early and you don't have a treatment, what's the use of that? Yeah. A person knowing that they're going to die of X or Y. Uh, probably, I think the biggest challenge is drug discovery at the moment because uh, level of hit and miss without the AI is extremely high and... Uh, a lot of companies working in this space haven't really progressed that much. And once things come into the clinic, like with the classical research, a lot of things fail. Because pathways, basically biological pathways, are so complex. And we don't know much about them. Thank you. OK. So if there are no further questions, we are moving to another talk. and. Uh, this is going to be Andrea McKelly. He's a professor of early intervention in mental health at KCL's Department of uh, Psychosis Studies, and he will tell us something about NeuroFind. Thank you, Andrea. Can you hear me okay? Yes, great. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Professor Andrea Michelli, and I work at the IOPTN here at King's College London. So in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to present a tool uh, that my research team has been developing over the past year and a half. And this is a tool that uses deep learning technology to make individualized predictions about brain design. So I'm going to start with a few words about the challenge, what we are trying to do with this tool. Um, we know that brain-based disorders represent about 10% of the global burden of disease. And of course, from neuroimaging studies, we also know that uh, brain disorders have a, a measurable uh, correlate in terms of structural alterations and also functional alterations. And some of these alterations are also predictive of future clinical outcomes. So in theory, we should be able to use this information to develop imaging-based tools that can inform diagnostic and prognostic assessment and perhaps also guide uh, treatment decisions. But in practice, this has been a very slow and 
challenging process. There are many reasons for this, but one of the key reasons is that historically, we rely on uh, statistical methods that uh, involve comparisons between groups. That's what we have always done in research. So our inferences also relate to groups of patients or groups of healthy controls. Whereas a clinician needs to make a, a, a diagnostic or prognostic decision or a treatment decision <coughs> about the individual who is in front of them. So there seems to be a gap between the way we do research, the methodologies that we use for research, and uh, the kind of inferences that are required in a clinical setting. So as you know already, uh, machine learning um, can help us address this gap. Uh, and in particular, we can use various machine learning methods to uh, develop models that capture key differences between various groups. For example, a group of people who respond to certain treatments and a group of people who do not respond to that treatment. And once we have developed this uh, model, we can then apply the model to a new individual, for example, in the context of neuroimaging, this could be a new scan, which was not part of the training data that were used to develop the model. And then the model will make a prediction, for example, is this individual uh, likely to belong to the group of responders or the group of non-responders? So we have used this framework, uh, this generic framework, uh, to uh, develop our tool, which is called uh, Neurofine. And uh, um, this is a, a web-based tool, so people have to, users have to uh, register, and then they're able to uh, log in on the system and upload uh, structural MRI scans. These are the kind of data that uh, are used uh, by this tool to make individualized inferences. And a user can be a clinician or a researcher, and they can uh, upload a single image, or if they're interested in making inferences about uh, several people, then they can upload uh, multiple scans at once. Uh, then, once the data has been uploaded, they get a dashboard, which looks a bit like this. They can see which jobs have been completed, which jobs are still ongoing, and so on. And uh, the tool uh, generates uh, what we call an individualized report, which is basically a report on each specific scan, each specific individual. Uh, and I'm now going to go through this report briefly and tell you what the key uh, components are. First of all, uh, the individual is compared against a, a, a reference database to see whether they fit um, the kind of standard healthy brain well or whether maybe they are uh, dif there's something about their brain that is different compared to what you would expect uh, in a healthy brain. So um, an outlier uh, index is being uh, provided which basically tells us whether the, how they uh, where they fall within the uh, continuum of, from normality to something unusual that one wouldn't expect. Now, if this outlier index is quite high, which means that basically the individual is an outlier, they don't really match uh, the standard healthy brain, then uh, the report also shows which regions have driven this conclusion. So, for example, an individual might be identified as an outlier because they've got reduced gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, so we can see these regions, we can see also a list of the regions. And in addition, the, the report um, uh, includes some, some estimations of how similar these regions are to the regions that we know are implicated in a number of mental health disorders. For example, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, depression, and so on. In other words, we give the user an idea of uh, uh, the similarity between these regions and the correlates of uh, the main mental health uh, illnesses. And finally, the report also includes some information about, about brain age, because as has been uh, mentioned earlier, brain age can be very interesting in terms of informing diagnosis, but also making uh, prognostic predictions. Uh, now, the next question is how did we develop the tool? What is the underlying methodology that allows the generation of this report? Uh, so it's important for me to, to give you a sense of this uh, within the limited time available. Basically, we took 
a, a mega data set of about 25,000 scans from healthy controls. And uh, the age range was from 16 to 82. Uh, the data came from about 80 scanners. And we also had about 3,000 scans from patients with various brain-based uh, disorders, including mental health, but also neurological disorders. And we used the data, the healthy control data, so the 25,000 scans from the healthy controls, to basically build a, a normative model of the, of the healthy brain, a model of what the brain should look like, like in the absence of disease. And how did we do this in practice? We used uh, a deep learning um, network, which is uh, called the deep autoencoder. The deep autoencoder is basically an artificial neural network uh, which comprises of two components. There is the component on the left, which is called the encoder. So this component basically processes the incoming data. In our case, it could be a structural MRI scan and extracts the key information from this uh, data and generates a latent representation of the image. Um, then there is the second component of the autoencoder, which is called decoder. And basically, it takes the latent representation and then transform that into an output which is as close as possible to the initial input, to the initial image that we had used as an input for the encoder. In other words, you can think of the autoencoder as an artificial neural, neural network that um, outputs uh, a, a, a reconstruct, reconstructed version of the original input. It extracts the key information, it intelligently discards the relevant information, creates a, um, a, a latent um, representation, and then from the latent representation, generates the input again, and the aim is to generate an input that is, uh, an output that is as close as possible to the original input. So I hope I've given you a sense of how the model works. The key point here that I want to emphasize is that if we train this model using lots of healthy control data, then um, when we use a, a scan from a healthy control as input, the output will be very similar to the input. But if we use a scan from a patient who has an unusual brain as an input, then the autoencoder will not be able to reproduce that uh, original image very closely. In other words, there will be a large reconstruction error. Uh, uh, this is the term we use to refer to the difference between the original input and the output. So the idea in, in Neurofine is to basically use this uh, reconstruction error, which is also known as a um, deviation metric. As, a, as an index of neuroanatomical deviation. And then we can extract this neuroanatomical deviation and compare patients and controls. We can correlate it with clinical scores. We can also estimate the accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity, uh, and so on. So there are multiple ways of using uh, this information to then validate the model. Uh, one of the big challenges of uh, developing Neurofine was to deal with interscanner variability because there are lots of methods for uh, harmonizing the data and dealing with interscanner variability, but these methods require one to have multiple scans from a certain uh, um, scanner. So th in particular, they require one to have a sense of the distribution of the data from a certain scanner. But we want Neurofine to be a tool that anyone can use wi with a single image. So someone anywhere in the world should be able to upload a single image from a scanner which was not part of the training data that were used to then develop our normative healthy brain. So we have worked quite hard on this aspect and we have developed an, a, a method that basically involves um, the use of a, of a different neural network, uh, machine learning uh, model, to then um, uh, basically um, capture the difference, the, the, the relationship between certain um, image quality metrics, which can be extracted from any image, and the kind of harmonization, the kind of correction that is required. So we've developed this model using our mega data set, 
And what this allows us to do is to then use an individual scan where we can extract the image quality metrics such as signal to noise ratio and predict, estimate the kind of correction that is required. I can talk about this method more if, if you're interested, but the, the key point is that uh, this method seems to be effective. What we see here in the lower part of the image are the p-values when you compare healthy controls from one data scanner against healthy controls from other scanners. Uh, the red means the p-values are very low, but after performing the, our um, the harmonization using our method, the, you can see lots of blue. In the upper part, that means the p-values have uh, increased, and the difference between healthy controls collect uh, a scan using different scanners is no longer as significant. Um, so uh, we hope that Neurofine will be useful in terms of assessing the presence of disease, uh, assessing risk of future disease, monitoring disease pro uh, progression, and also uh, informing stratification and optimizing treatment. Um, one of the key questions for us is, how does this tool differ from what's already there? Have we done anything different that's not been done compared to what's been done before? So we've looked at the literature very carefully and we've identified eight tools that are already existing and that allow researchers and clinicians to make inferences at the level of the uh, individual, which is exactly what we want to do with Neurofine. Uh, Neurofine has some distinctive characteristics, first of all, uh, it can be applied to mental health disorders. The existing tools tend to be developed for neurological disorders. So there is great, there is a gap there that hopefully can be addressed uh, by Neurofine. Uh, also provides an estimate of brain age, uh, which existing tools don't necessarily do. Uh, it's, it uses a whole brain approach, whereas existing tools tend to be based in regions of interest that mainly develop for dementia so they, they are based on measurements of the uh, hippocampus and so on. And also, as I mentioned briefly, uh, we estimate and correct for interscanner variability, and this is key if we are to uh, allow someone to just upload a single scan for the scanner which wasn't part of the, of the training data, and this is key if we want the tool to become, um, to be used um, worldwide. Uh, finally, I want to mention the people who are developing uh, um, this tool. Um, we, we call ourselves the Machine Learning Mental Health Lab, the MTPM, and I couldn't emphasize enough the fact that uh, without uh, the input of every single person within the team, we, we wouldn't have uh, Neurofine as it is now. And so I, I really want to emphasize And we also have some external collaborators, Professor Joao Sato and Professor Lynn Scaroni from Brazil uh, and the US. And uh, finally, I want to say thank you to our founder, which is the uh, Red Cone Trust. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really interesting, especially, you know, when, when you take into account that current uh, diagnostics and imaging, you know, they're looking all into biomarkers, but everything is cohort based, uh, everything is case study. It's not individualized. So very, very interesting approach. Um, questions, please. I oh, think I've been so clear that Of course, you know, this is. Hi, um, very quick question. For the autoencoder that you have, um, is it a 3D auto? Is it a 3D autoencoder? The technical person who's in charge of developing this is actually here. It's Walter. Where is Walter? Oh, okay. it, I'm actually going to uh, ask him to answer because <laughs> his, his input, as I said, has been so critical. Sorry, what? We don't have the entire user interface for the We are using pre-processing data using pre-processing software. That we basically assess it based on performances that we extract from the features. 
So, uh, yeah, you will. So, dolphin color is on the surface. Sorry? Dolphin color is on. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear something. Oh. Just a lack of microphone. So, the dolphin color is, is not 3D. It is not using a 3D composition of the network. Because it's applying on feature extracted from the, the brain. Okay. We are using, are you familiar with Free Surfer? Yeah. Sure. So we are using Free Surfer as the name. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Sorry, okay. Renato. It's always good to have your collaborators with you. Um, more questions? Yeah, over there and then here. Uh, those or first ones, yeah. Maybe. It doesn't matter. Maybe you can start here and then we go. Um, Great talk. So, do you imagine this is actually going to be something like a 23andMe kind of style of thing, where I, you know, I randomly have an MRI scan, I can upload it, and then have an understanding of my, you know, potential mental health issues? Um, or, you know, where's your kind of application kind of setting? Is it can we within the NHS and say, oh, we'll use our service, and then we can? Yeah. So, uh, it's definitely not a tool that diagnoses people, but it's a tool that could support. Clinical assessment made by the clinician, um, including the diagnostic assessment. So at, at this stage, we definitely don't think that this will diagnose people. It's, it provides useful information, uh, and personally, I think many people here might uh, might agree that I don't think diagnosis is perhaps that exciting or that useful because uh, we can already use uh, standardized clinical tests to decide whether someone has a, a mental disorder or not. In fact, there are machine learning studies that have been validated based on standardized clinical tests. So what this means is that if you have an algorithm that is 100% accurate, it means it can just replicate what the clinician does. It's not that useful. I think looking into the future is much more interesting and much more um, yeah, clinically useful. So developing tools that can tell the clinician something they don't already know. So in this example, for example, uh, if looking at the kind of pattern of, uh, um, looking at the, the, the kind, of, kind of pattern of brain alterations that someone shows at the individual level, may allow us to find subgroups who then have different clinical uh, outcomes or show different responses to treatments. So that's something in the future that a clinical assessment right now might not be able to reveal. So, um, but we will need to assess all of these. At the moment, we are extracting individual level information. We need to carry out applied research to see whether this individualized information is actually useful for making predictions in the future. This will involve working closely with clinicians in validating uh, the tool in a real life, con real world context. Okay, and we have two. We have two short questions left. Um, I'm sorry, just that one, and then George, and I'm sorry, then it's done. We need to move. Okay. Um, have you considered using other types of brain data? Yeah, good question. Uh, we have considered it, but first of all, we want to start with something simple, and structural MRI data are very practical. We, we want to come up with something practical that will not exclude lots of potential users. Um, including, for example, fMRI data, I suspect will enhance the accuracy, especially if you extract connectivity data matrices. But then it will make it a lot less, um, a, lot, a lot harder to translate in, in the real world. So it's definitely a prospect, but we want to start with something practical. Uh, just, just a very, very last question. Just following up on my previous question. It's actually quite similar to the question that I asked James Cole. Um, so we did a study a few years ago on using algorithms like FreeSurf and SPM, where we took something like 16 people and put them through 10 different scanners, where we tried to harmonize sequences as much as we could. And all of those algorithms have a variability, even after harmonization, actual physics harmonization, up to 10% variability in measurements. And that is more than five years of atrophy in a patient with dementia. So uh, how, how, can you, how can you have an algorithm like this that works using something like FreeSurfer when clearly FreeSurfer has this massive gap in performance? So this is a big problem for the neuroimaging community. I don't think we have a perfect solution. Uh, but there are harmonization methods out there 
which have been shown to help. So the fact that they don't, they're not helpful, it doesn't mean that they should be discarded. So for example, the, here we are using the combat harmonization method. It has been shown to be useful, it has been shown to be, to make a difference. So um, this is the one we're implementing in integrated within our uh, neural network. Um, but it is, uh, you're absolutely right, it remains a massive problem uh, for anyone who is interested in clinical translation. And uh, I know lots of people are looking into this problem. I think what I've shown you is that what we are proposing makes it a bit of a difference. Uh, but of course, it's, it's, we have not solved the, the problem for the whole neuroimaging community. So it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. Thank you once more. Uh, and we are moving to our last, but certainly not least, talk. It's Professor Richard Stewart. Robert Stewart, I'm sorry. Um, professor of Psychiatry, and he will tell us something how to use AI to extract more data from the electronic health records. Thanks very much. So it's... Um, I guess I'm, I mean, you can decide for yourselves what's AI and what's not about this, but it's about particularly around sort of the resource um, for AI um, through the relatively new thing we've got now of, of digital health records or electronic health records. So we've had big data sets for a long time, as, as you know, so genetic um, data sets have lots of information on people and administrative data of information on uh, lots of people. Um, but we've only relatively recently had big data where you've got both lots of columns and lots of rows, and that presents these sorts of challenges listed there. And electronic health records um, are a, a key example of this. So when I began research, you used to have this idea of a trade-off. You were either dealing with research data, which had a lot of detail on relatively few people, um, or you had administrative data which could run to the millions but you didn't have much information on each of those people and it could be rather thin. Whereas if we just think about health records generally, it's a sort of expanding database. No one's at the moment talking about sort of getting rid of health records um, as, as they used to in paper days. Um, the digital sort of files just keep accumulating and accumulating and you know, the volume of traffic going through the NHS in any given sort of sector of it is, is enormous. So this is us at the South London and Lordsley um, where we built our case register just over 10 years ago. Um, so we call it CRIS, Clinical Record Interactive Search. Um, I think it, I mean, the general practice um, back then had sort of some databases, what's now called CPRD. Um, that was in existence and some other ones, but we were really sort of mental health care was then the next generation as it were after that. Um, and there wasn't an awful lot of um, precedent to go with, so we sort of slightly made it up as we went along, just trying to sort of keep the, the governance right and everything. Um, so essentially, uh, the South London and Maudsley electronic health record system now has over 400,000 cases on the system, 35,000 active at any particular time, and what the system Chris does is run a sort of several path lines, both de-identifying the data and um, rearranging it in ways that people can make databases out of to support research. And I don't know, it's probably somewhere between 150 and 200 publications now have, have used these data. I think one of the key points I'd want to get across is that you can think of this as a sort of technical solution, but actually it's over 50% of the issue is, is around governance and around finding a structure and a process um, through which to sort of render these data available and set this sort of system up so that everyone's happy and has all the necessary approvals. Our process was patient-led from the start, continues to be patient-led, um, and that, that's been a sort of key principle behind everything. And it's, 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 it's been sort of quite substantially replicated um, elsewhere. So the, the difficulty is when we start, when you start with a health record, you sort of start using it and then you find out there's not an awful lot you can use it for because there's not an awful lot of structure in the data. Um, so what you want to use it for is, uh, where it's most strong is to look at all the people receiving different interventions in routine care and what happens to them because there's not really an awful, an awful lot of alternative to that in research terms. You can do a trial, but that just measures a rather select sample and whether people get better or not 
um, with one particular intervention doesn't tell you who gets better or not, and it doesn't tell you much about the sort of routine way in which that intervention is given. Um, whereas these big um, administrative databases can really tell you about adverse events, response, recovery, and, and these sorts of things. But then you also need, um, you need to know why people are receiving the intervention, the indications for it, and you need to know the sort of other contextual factors that might influence the outcome. And when you begin the process, records on their own don't have an awful lot that can be easily extracted as a database. So you can get sort of good information about people's age and gender and ethnicity and the sort of demographic things, um, and you can get diagnoses. Um, but when we began, there wasn't even any sort of structured data on medication, which is rather important in a mental health care data set. Um, you knew about what service contacts people had and when they got admission, admitted and discharged from services. And you had scales like the Health Information Outcome Scale, which I'm showing there, which is, is, a rather, is quite interesting and useful, but it's, it's somewhat um, basic in terms of the information conveyed there. So the first decision point you have when you set this sort of thing up is, well, you're lacking structured data. Can you sort of make people give you more structured data? So do you go back to the clinical services and say, actually, we'd like you to fill out lots more questionnaires and forms and data sheets and all the rest of it? Um, that's a decision point. Some people go down that route. We didn't. Um, so I know some people who've created systems like this where the response has been to try to kind of sort of get lots and lots of structure out of the clinical encounters. Um, but it's difficult to sustain that because it's not something clinicians like doing um, and they tend to sort of drift away from it. Or else, which is the, what the approach we took, is well actually there's information there, it's all in there, but how can we get more out and make it available? And the first um, way of doing it is, is through data linkage, so linking our mental health records with other databases that will provide at least some of that missing information. And over the last 10 years, we've done a lot of that. We've linked the CRIS system at the Maudsley with a number of things like um, records on mortality, hospitalization, uh, cancer registry records, for example, looking at whether people with mental disorders and their process, if they get cancer, whether they get sort of what treatments they get and that sort of type of thing. Um, and more recently, sort of expanding into non-healthcare databases, so education records for um, children and adolescents, important issues around there, around mental health and childhood, educational performance at schools. Um, so we linked to that. We've recently linked to, um, or about to link to sort of benefits receipt data from the Department of Work and Pensions, so you can know a bit, bit more about people's coming in and out of employment. Um, we've linked to local census records um, in order to kind of find out um, socioeconomic status. And that's, uh, each one is quite a long, hard process of negotiation and paperwork and governance and approvals. Uh, there are technical elements to linkages that have made life easier in terms of common encryption at, at both ends and um, increasing sort of ways in which you can put data together without actually seeing the identifiers or without identifiers having to change hands. And then the governance structure is a lot more clearer than it used to be around, what, around setting up um, linkages. And that's one of the, I, I'm, the we've, um, a part of a big MRC um, process trying to sort of improve mental health care data science in the UK called Pathfinder Awards. And um, we've got one of these and one of our projects is around, can we actually replicate these linkages in other sites that have um, CRIS or CRIS-like systems in, in mental health care? Um, but the second way, um, and perhaps the most important way for us of expanding information has been through natural language processing because the information is there in the record it's just not in a way that's there that's easy for researchers to use it's there mostly in text fields so people still come and have a lot of information recorded on them but it gets written down in extensive documents in mental health care and so we've pushed quite hard um, in this sort of sphere working with um, collaborators um, at the University of Sheffield and more recently sort of building a group up locally um, of expertise in clinical text um, processing. And going back to that sort of the, bi the bits of information that um, I and my colleagues want for a research project, we've just basically been going down them, ticking them off, um, developing natural language processing algorithms step by step, sort of for each sort of bit, and then sort of once, once that's there, 
um, that generates structured data, we can start sort of answering questions we couldn't previously. So we've, for example, been able to um, code out all the medications people receive and also sort of look, do more advanced algorithms around adherence and compliance and non-response resistance, these sorts of types of things. A lot of contextual factors around, say, physical health or stressors or substance use, this sort of type of thing. A lot of work on the different symptoms that people present with um, because diagnoses aren't treated in mental health care, it's predominantly symptoms. So you need to know that and there's no other way in which they're available. So there's a lot more filling out of the database and it's become a lot bigger as a result. Um, and in this area, which I guess is uh, sort of overlaps into the AI, and the, I, I would say here are, s are some examples of current frontiers. Um, temporality is quite a tricky one, coding sort of when things happened in time and putting together timelines from all of these things from the text. For example, how long has someone had symptoms when they present with psychosis? We know that's really important for outcomes. Um, trying to work that out from letters and text is, is com complex, but we're getting there. Complicated constructs like suicidality and violence are important. Um, we've done a bit of sort of document structuring, looking for domains within documents um, and, other th and other things besides. This is just an example of the complexity. Um, I think Anna's here and, and she's been working with Natasha and others um, on um, occupation. Can, can we actually find out what people's occupation is from their record? It often, it often is recorded, um, but it's quite a complicated process um, that's still ongoing, and, and if we can do that, then we can sort of look at whether, where, what people are working in, and, um, and that's important individual level information. And this is, again, another project from our Pathfinder Award is around exporting that resource um, in a variety of ways to a lot of other sites. And through this, we've developed a cloud infrastructure that can sit within the NHS um, where NHS data can be um, processed through algorithms. The algorithms can be housed up there and someone else, any other trust, can sort of upload their documents, download it within the necessary NHS firewalls, um, do it all securely, have a proper agreement in place. That's, that's the idea behind this. We've got a functional cloud, which is sort of beginning what are now to move towards actually making this into a service. And then Cogstack is a similar system that uh, Richard may want to say more about. Um, and that's been developed at King's College Hospital in acute care particularly. It's a much more agile system, much more geared towards life processing, um, including text. So Chris and Cogstack now sort of sit as complementary resources and we're trying to sort of bring the two together much more um, in terms of, um, of that functionality. And essentially what you have in the end is um, a sort of integrated system where you've got the health record, the EHR in the centre, rendered available um, to support research, but as also sort of clinical audit and service development. You've got sort of um, the derived data from the text, but external data, bioresource data, um, other things coming in, devices and wearables will become more and more important. You can then sort of take that and make and, and sort of network it out. You can set it up in various forms elsewhere in the country at other trusts. So you start having the, the ability to do things multi-site and then build national infrastructure from the bottom up um, by putting all of these bits together. Um, so we've, in terms of the output and in terms of actually sort of beginning to translate this into um, care, the sort of graph there on the top right is an algorithm um, that was set up to help services uh, monitor their antipsychotic prescribing in dementia. In order to do that, you need to know at a given point who's got dementia and is receiving an antipsychotic from your service. That's actually a moderate amount of algorithm behind that. We can start doing this at particular census points. We feed it back to the services um, and they sort of um, can see whether they're sort of filling out the monitoring forms that they should be doing. Um, just something on MediCheck. Yeah, I won't do it. Yeah, just to end off on MediCheck. This is basically a, a fairly sort of simple online resource and app that we've built, which is derived from Chris data and is, is at the moment looking at anticholinergic medication received in dementia. So you can put in your individual medicines in that and you get a score out of it as to how sensory anticholinergic it is, um, which we know in, uh, those things are not good um, in dementia. Um, and the idea is to sort of bring in Chris data to, to start sort of 
looking at way more medication properties in dementia so that people just have access to this, people with dementia tend to be taking a lot of medicines and so people have more and more access to um, what they're being prescribed and what properties that it has and I'll leave those and my final point is just this isn't a technology it isn't even a governance model it's, it's as much as anything else I'm building a team together there's no such thing as a data scientist I think data science of this nature is about bringing people together from lots of different specialties and that's been as much um, as what we've developed over the last 10 years as anything else. Thank you. Panel. So who would like to open the question session? Hmm? I believe that many of you are using Chris system. Oh, George, again. Just a very pragmatic question, uh, which is actually not about research at all. So a lot of the things that you describe here are very computer science-y, software development infrastructure type setup. And it's extremely hard in the university environment to actually hire people with kinds of skills, uh, not only for financial reasons, but also just attracting the right talent. H how do you do that? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the team building is as much of an effort as anything else. It's finding people. For us, it's particularly finding NHS savvy people, because university tech people don't tend to know enough about the NHS. NHS systems are complicated, and ideally, you're looking from within the NHS and their IT departments at people who work with their data, not in necessarily in a very computational way, but understand the sort of way NHS records particularly work. Um, because and, and what we've set up is an environment within the NHS, so our system sits within our trusts firewall. It doesn't sit within a university at all, and that's been a thing in itself: is is getting an environment within the NHS that can house statistical software, and, um, you know, things unheard of within NHS environments, and getting a good relationship with our local IT department about sort of how we manage that process and set up a research domain within a trust, a mental health trust. But yes, I mean, finding and keeping good, good staff is, is as, as important as anything else. Um, and they're few and far between. And one of the things, we, you know, the, the more this is done across trusts, the more of capacity building there will be in the country. Because a lot of it's about that sort of basic, hard to define knowledge um, that's, you know, that's beyond sort of a qualification. It's experience, it's, it's know-how. Um, and that's something we, you know, we need to generate and we need to keep. Thank you. One last question. If none, if there are none, then, oh, there is one. Thank you for the lecture. So I wanted to find out what the decision-making process is like for integrating different data sets. So for example, how do you decide whether you want to incorporate for wearables or what's, how do you decide what data is relevant and kind of important? Um, from my point of view as the academic lead, I'm usually looking for someone who's, who's going to run with it and has got a research project in mind because we can go in all sorts of directions and we have been before and develop what we think is a nice resource that no one ends up using. So I want to know that there's a use behind it. Um, and it's, if someone comes to me and says, look, if we do this, it will generate this and that and the other, then I'm, I'm going to be sort of swayed by that. We haven't had to do, we haven't sort of moved, I don't think wearables aren't sort of being used widely enough to sort of begin, I think that will happen, uh, and we're preparing ourselves for that, that to happen in the next five or 10 years. There will be coming increasing amounts of stuff that's routinely used. We've only relatively recently sort of sorted out linking with the imaging um, because there's increasing numbers of studies that and now that we can phenotype at depth, there's a lot of novelty that we can bring new stuff from the clinical record together with the imaging. And once the imaging becomes sort of easier to process at scale, then you can suddenly create very large imaging databases with very deep um, clinical phenotyping, if you want to call it that. So that's been, that's been a sort of a, a recent development because we haven't had the demand before. You know, once, once services start using external devices more in routine practice, which as we've heard is not, is not there yet much in the NHS, or it's not in, 
mental health care a great deal, but will be, I'm fairly sure. Then you're looking for that data set and you're looking to how to bring it in and you're having to decide are you going to bring the whole data set or are you just going to bring in the informative metadata that are derived from it and where it's going to sit and how that's going to sort of process real time and, and there's all sorts of things that, that will flow from that that we're bracing ourselves for. Thank you very much. And uh, before we uh, move on to our panel, I would like to ask you to join me in thanking all the speakers today. I think they did a really wonderful job and they really deserve a big applause. Thank you. And Professor Richard Dobson will now chair the panel discussion with uh, our speakers, George, Ivana, uh, Manisha join us and uh, Jessica.